Alright, today we're just going to be doing an overview of Dominions 5 because I'm hoping to get into it. Um, I don't know how well that's going to work for reasons I'll get into in this because this video is just going to be an overview on uh, what the game is and uh, what issues there are recording it, discussing it, things like that. So Dominions 5 at its core is a 4x strategy game. So for example, games like Civs, games like the Total War games, um, all fall under this category. Stellaris, Masters of Orion. Um, the problem is, and I'm going to use an RPG analysis, if modern games like say Civs 5, uh, Civs 6, um, The Total Wars, well to compare it to say Dungeons and Dragons, those games would be like 5e. The uh, games like old Masters of Orion, not the reboot from Wargame, uh, and and like Star Empires, those old 4Xs, those are like 3.5. A lot more complicated, but also a lot more, you can do more with it. To put it into perspective of those, Dominions 5 is like Pathfinder. It is horrendously complicated. And because of that, there's a lot you can do with it. Um, there's a bunch of steps to creating a game. Um, all the details, everything else. Um, I can pull that up to demonstrate it right for a bit. But for example, you can create a world. Um, when that happens, there's apparently going to be a bit of lag from me. Hopefully you can still hear me fine when it does that. Uh, and it doesn't automatically give me a break. Um, and you got a bunch of set maps. Um, the Steam Workshop has a bunch of maps, so like these ones, this, this, and that. All these are, uh, actually I think most of these, are maps that you can download off the Steam Workshop. It's just full of them. Um, alternatively, it has, under Tools and Manuals, you can create your own maps. Um, go through a random map creator, etc. Or again, for the purposes of that specific game, you could just go ahead and create one then based on like make it you know 20 provinces per player and then in the next set you can set how many people are going to be in it i don't like wraparound um i understand east and west wraparound is more realistic um wraparound is just literally so in games like uh civ 6 for example uh has east west wraparound it's basically with a map does not have a set east or west border so when you get to the quote-unquote end of the map, it'll show you the next side, like a globe, like that stuff's supposed to be like an, you know, actual world. Whereas they do have a north-south pole, so there's no north-south wraparound. Um, but like the Earth has no east-west pole, a wraparound thing does not have an east or west edge. Um, I don't like that. I like having edges. I like corners. I'm a defensive person in strategy games always. Um, and so part of the problem is, just call it the game name, um, when you're setting it up, you can just type whatever. If it's already in use, you're out of luck, because I, I do a million and one tests in this game for a reason I'll, that will actually be showcased in a bit. But, um, I'll just call this recording one. This one isn't what I'm actually going to do, so I don't have to worry about the name, I can just throw it up later. Um, next, you have an option of arrows. Um, the early age... And the descriptions are, they're not misleading, but they are overly simple. So like the early age. The early ages are full of magic and civilizations at its beginning. In most places, iron isn't being used yet, and armor weapons are made of wood, stone, and bronze. Uh, mages are most powerful in this age, and there are abundance of magic resources. It is a time of legends. Now, these statements are true. Weapon, like iron weapons aren't really being used yet and this is one of the games that loves 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 um to adhere to uh myth lores and folklores because it's it's a game about gods fighting pure and simple you are a god of a nation and you're fighting the gods of other nations assert yourself the game um is the premise i probably should have covered that but whatever um this is true <clears throat> But it's not necessarily mages are most powerful in this age because they have more magic in this age. It's because relative to these units that don't have iron and as such lower stat scores, they do significantly more by comparison. Whereas, say, uh, in the late age, they're like, uh, 
made magic resources and did a little bit made us become more organized in the knowledge of different magic paths greater than ever before. Um, but iron and steel are readily available. Um, so while the resources dwindle, mages have good combination magic paths. Um, we'll get into that a bit more when we get into creator creation, uh, to god creation. Pretender is what they call them because there can be only one god. Whoever wins is the god. Um, and so, like, Middle Age, make progress. Modern technologies are now available to most ma nations. Mages have lost some of their former power, and magic resources are not as abundant. This is, this, again, is less, it's not that the mages have less magic in the Middle Age comparative to the early, not that I've noticed anyway, though I am by no means an expert in this game. Um, it's more the units have armor. They have better weapons and armor. They can do more. And so relative to the units, mages are not as game-breaking, I guess. Um, game-breaking is a strong word for it when everyone can do it, but the point stands. Um, and so once you have your arrow set, um, you hit OK. Then you can set up numbers. Now, this is why, despite the fact that on Steam it says I have like 50, 60 hours in this game, that does not mean I am good at this game. Because as I'm sure you just noticed, I'll hover back over. Bam. This, is a, this game has hot seat, so you can, if you just want to test a certain mechanic or, you know, sandbox get the feel of things, you can just play a game against yourself as many times as you want to check out as many things as you want. Um, doesn't appear you can remove people. Oh, right, no, you have to go into something I'm going to show in a second to get rid of people. But, and so you can go ahead, nation, um, what the player is. Uh, they want to make an AI, and then there's standard defensive or aggressives, or default to random. Um, but part of the thing is, and now you can click, pick your nation. Click nation, bam. This is more or less, I have some mods that add extras, but like, this uh, is up, is all base nations for middle age. For the middle age um so like this is you have all these different options and all of them play differently this is not a uh again 4x in the way of civs where it's like everyone does the same thing you play the same way and you just have some buffs for certain things now everyone plays very differently for example if you pick uh jotunheim your game is going to be incredibly different from say man or maritonon or any of these other ones, especially if you choose, because there's two main categories, um, land and sea nations. There are underwater nations, where all of your stuff is underwater, and you have to get onto land to fight the land factions, which are most people. Um, so there's different pros and cons there as well. Um, this list is just the list for Middle Age. So if we cancel out and go, say, Early Ages, we have a list. Some of the names are the same. And some of them, if you read their descriptions, they come from, like, Man, for example, like, Mabarni is the early age version of what Man was in the middle. Um, and so as you read, each one has their backstories and whatnot. And so, like, you know, you'll see things like Vanheim, Helheim, Niflheim. Niflheim becomes Jotunheim, um, which was the example I had pulled earlier. Um, things like that. Um, some come in and go out, basically. Um, like, Ur is in the middle age become in the early age becomes uh where is it uruk in the middle age and then i'm pretty sure they don't exist in the late age um yeah they're just gone yeah you'll notice the late age has the least factions but things like uh where is it tian chi even keeps the same name through all the tian chi and mid clan um and all are three of the factions that do that, that they have the same name throughout the entirety, and they are, they're not the same. They do play differently between eras, which is part of what adds to the complexity. Um, and then again, in addition to random, you can actually be specific, like, I don't want to know who I'm fighting against, um, if you're at that level, I'm not, but like, if you're at that level where you, either it just doesn't matter, you don't feel like, like, Dictating who you're fighting and what's going on, 
you can set random, you can set random land, meaning it picks, in this case, any of these factions, and I think all of the mod ones are also uh, land factions in this case, but that means it won't pick Relay or uh, Atlantis, because those are the only two underwater factions in the late era. Um, so Middle Ages is one that's, I think it has the biggest list, either it or early. Uh, the reason is because a lot of the earlies transfer over, like Arcosophile is another one where the same name all three eras. Um, but like, in the early age there's, say, Aramore. Aramore is a good one, um, because each one of these nations has a story. Um, so Aramore is, it's stylized on Rome, um, to put it in perspective. Aramore is stylized on Rome, so Aramore in the early era is Rome and the height of its power. Um, in this case, they delve into death magic, um, and they basically open a portal to the underworld, and the faction shatters into these three. Pythium is a combination of them and one of the other factions, but basically, Aramore is Aramore, the capital, which collapsed. Um, basically, it forms the zombie apocalypse in the Middle Age. I'm not even joking about that. Dominion of an Aramore faction kills population and raises them to skeletons. It's as close as you can get to the zombie apocalypse in this game. As such, because a lot of stuff in the game, which if we get to that point we'll get into, uh, requires population, Aramore is very hated by everyone else. Because if Aramore's dominion sits on a thing long enough, the population will drop to zero, and then it's just worthless to everyone forever period. Um, if you get to it fast enough, uh, with enough priests, uh, you can salvage some of it, but odds are, if you don't get to Aramore quickly, the core of Aramore lands is just gonna be dead. Um, both because of its native pop kill, um, that it does, and because there is no reason as Aramore not to take death scales, which we'll get into when we get into pre Pretender creation. Um, but, the TLDR is a lot of reasons that you want to kill the zombie apocalypse as quickly as possible. Solaria is basically, it was far enough away, and there was enough of the old, uh, old faith people there to warn that branch of the Imperial family that a cataclysm was going to happen. Astral is basically like written in the stars, horoscopes, astrology, that kind of crap. Um, astral, astrology, wild. Um, but, and so it carries with it fortune-telling magics and stuff like that. Um, prophecies, that crap. So, they split off, but they still use the, they still use the dead in the Middle Era, but they're also the living. It's not just the zombie apocalypse like Amor is. Pythium is, uh, the other faction that they con that they're sort of a part of is, uh, like, the thing that gives them serpent cataphracts, because the description's on the bottom. Um, I can't hover the mouse over it, because then it's not the, the, this area. You hover over it, like, they have, they have serpent cataphracts. What does that mean? It means they ride, basically, hydras. Um, baby hydras. But, um, it's basically, they were taking over another faction when the cataclysm hit the capital. And... So this section is basically the combination of those two. Um, Sclera is basically uh, halfway to the zombie apocalypse, halfway to uh, back to the early age. Um, actually, as a point of fact, uh, in earlier Dominions games, because this is Dominions 5, um, they all use the same engine and they all more or less use the same lists with changes in each game, typically additions. Um, Sclera used to be the Middle Age, and then Aramore was the Late Age uh, version of the same faction, but they've changed that now. So, Aramore is the zombie apocalypse. Sclera is halfway between, is Romans using the dead as well, um, basically. And then Pythium is the colonies that completely rejected the death magic. And then in the Late Era, um, I don't know if Pythium exists. Pythium does. Uh, so, Pythium is. Rome is, it's sort of Rome, because it still, it still uses the Legionnaires, um, they have their stuff that's from the other faction they ain't still, um, but they have the heretical mystery cult, so this is basically, uh, oh, who was it, Aurelian's Rome, I want to say, um, where 
the Cult of Sol Invictus and everything else is going on. Lemuria is Sclera, basically. Um, in the story of that the game does, and you get it in lore from unit descriptions, nation, dis big nation descriptions, which we'll see when we get into pretender creation and spell descriptions, things like that, of national spells. Um, we'll get into that as well. Uh, the you get the story. So Lemuria is Scalera. Basically, Scalera screwed up. Like, Aramor got wiped, the zombie apocalypse Aramor got wiped out um, from a combination of, like, Pythium, Scalera, Marignan, notes in its stuff that it was heavily involved in dealing with Aramor. Um, I don't know who else was involved. Uh, not Yomo, not Chinchi. Because uh, the Yomo, Shinuyama in the Middle Age, and uh, Yomi in the Early Age is the not in Japan. Tianchi is the not China in the late era. They're Mongolian controlled China, but still China. Um, but yeah, so Lemuria is Scalera, because Scalera still delved too heavily into dead, death magic, basically opened a uh, gate to the realm of the dead, and now they're, uh, they're ghosts. So they're basically ghost air more in the late age functionally, but lore-wise, they're late age Scalera. Um, as such, they just have a new name. But things like, it was M the Mavarni, and then Man keeps Man the second two eras. Alm keeps Alm all three. Marignan, I don't think... Does Marignan exist in the early era? Um, I'm running on tangents at this point. No, it does not. Um, that makes sense. But, um, and then, again, all these these three are mod factions. They don't count. Um, so I think this game is highly moddable. Uh, unfortunately, most of that isn't on the Steam Workshop. You have to find forums for that, but a quick Google search will take care of you honestly um and so once you pick you know the map which we still have it on that custom recording whatever uh the middle ages you have the number of people since we're just displaying us i'm just going to do two human um i don't really care you can't do one for obvious reasons because it's just like well you automatically won because there's no one else here um i'll just pick a couple um mictlin is a complicated one and a weird one uh, like, and that's the thing, is each one of these plays wildly differently, relies on completely different mechanics entirely, and have completely different play styles. So, for example, like, uh, oh, what's a good one in this age I can do? Um, like, Ashad uses certain schools of magic, um, Uruk uses some, like, everyone has access to some magic and you can find in the independent not controlled by any one provinces more magics that will let you get into the other paths of magic so that part isn't too bad but like like Jotunheim, Ashad, a few others like they have giants and they use giants have giant recruitment like Flinret has it too um it literally says to form giants wild um but everyone has like their own mechanics and what they do like again airborne is the zombie apocalypse so that's going to play incredibly differently than say all where you are holy roman empire plate iron like not really faith i can't say faith gunpowder and whatever because this game refuses to use gunpowder in any way despite having china and the late age which really should but that's neither here nor there um but the, they're steel boys they love their armor they're heavily armored people uh machaka is like is based on the african tribes um so they're very lightly armored in most cases things like that they'll play very differently their needs are very different on the map and in play style and in creator setup. Again, we'll get into that. So I'll just grab a couple real quick and we can get into character. And to, uh, pretender creation. Excuse me. Um, things like, and to, like, Katissa, the Dominions cause lands to turn into rotting marshland that causes disease in everyone who isn't cold-blooded or has swamp survival. Um, things like that, which are... Things like that will typically get you ganged up on in multiplayer. I don't do multiplayer. Multiplayer in this is honestly hard to set up if you can't find a group um 
they have a Discord, and so if you're really looking for it, you can. I don't. I enjoy single player stuff. But that's the thing. I've given the most basic of basic overviews that haven't really even touched on the mechanics of the game, and we're already 20 minutes into this description. I don't know if you guys can see that. Probably it's probably not on the video, but that's where my timestamp is on my recording software. Um, so I'll just grab a couple. Uh, Ulm and Agartha. Ulm I play a lot, so I kind of know how Ulm works. Agartha. Eh. Um, I'm probably not going to play anything off of this game, so it doesn't matter as so much. So when you hit OK. There's also uh, Disciple Games. Um, some of you may have noticed the option. It was like right over here um, that I just didn't tick. Disciple is how you do teams, where it's basically uh, one person is the actual pretender god in charge of setting up your dominion. We'll get into that again in a second. And uh, everyone else is basically the prophets of that god. Um, so you have your nation. They each play separate nations, but they're all on the same team, worshipping the same god, technically. Um, so now you get to the... Uh, actual nation screen once you've hit okay and set all that up so every player that's human controlled will get this screen um, so once we finish here we'd create one for the agartha one and then we'd actually set up the map options yeah that's the thing we aren't even into the actual gameplay map options um yet and so on this screen you get a description of the nation a short not a short oversimplification of the nation um and then the unit and commander lists that are unique to this faction. Um, I say unique to this faction. Some of them are specific, and you'll notice, like when I have guardian, when I hover over the guardian, it says down here can only be recruited in the capital. Um, only a, some things can only be recruited in the capital. Some can be in any castle you build. We'll get into that later as well. Um, and so, and what holy site and what magic sites are in your capital? Not holy sites, magic sites. Oh, they're two. Um, so, for example, the the start with the keep of Ulm. This is what lets you recruit all of your uh, special units, and that's why they're uh, capital only um, in this case. So, and then the forges of Ulm produce. Uh, this is earth gems. Now we're over at sensor gems on the bottom. Um, each magic path has a resource with it, a gem, if you will. Um, it'll be easier to show that in the next screen they all are but like for example this priest smith here he's got his stats his whatnots that they tell you like you know what what's his attack skill what's his whatever and if you like right click over it's um like a normal soldier has attack skill of 10 this guy has 10 so he's roughly average but he's a commander and a mage so if he's actually in a point where attack and defense skill matter something has gone wrong and he will likely die um plus because he's protection eight protection is basically the armor value um Again, thickness of any armor, including natural armor, protection value subtracted from the attacker's strength and weapon damage when calculating total damage. So, like, for example, this is his average damage, like, factored all of his stats. When he attacks with his maul, he will typically do if the attack hits this much damage. So, it's that minus protection is the effective damage on a person. So, for example, if you had two priest smiths get into a slap fight, whoever actually hits first, which is whoever attacks first, will likely one-shot the other, because 22 damage minus 8 is 14. He has 12 health. He's dead. Um, not a fighter, which he's a mage. You don't want them fighting. So again, you can also see how much research they can do. We'll get into that when we get into the actual game. Um, and then what magic pass he has. So he is, and you can right click. Those you can't right click on to see anything. Like that's what you're hearing that noise is. Um, but with things over here that actually like gray out when you hover over them, you can right click on those and it'll tell you. So for example, this guy gives a resource bonus. So extra, he gives 10 extra resources to any fort he's stationed in. Um, so you want to stack these in your capital, in wherever, and they'll just up the resource count, which is very important for Ulm in particular, because the resource cost per units, I know you don't have a really that much of a frame of reference here, but for example, like, it's four times the gold cost in resources to make this unit. So you want a lot of resources as Ulm. So having these smiths that give an extra 10 per smith 
is a great way to boost your recruitment capabilities. Um, they also have this forge bonus, where uh, mage is very efficient when forging magic items. This cost is cost reduction in gems, so basically, if something costs, I have a mod that makes it lower already, but if something costs, say, the default for a level 1 earth item is 5 gems, well, if he's forging it, now it costs 4 because of that one. Um, there are also magic items you can forge to give them extra bonuses. Um, dwarven hammer is what they call them. Um, the one I'm thinking of in particular that gives extra forge bonus. And you can stack those to make magical item forging very, very cheap. This is part of Ulm's gimmick in the Middle Age, specifically. Um, they also have this trait, which is wonderful, called the Mundane Researcher. Researchers will not have his magic research hindered by a drain scale in any way. And we'll get into that in a second, what that means, but um, actually I'll do it. So when you hit OK on that screen, you can always just click View Nation Description and you just pull the screen back up. So if you're ever like just setting up a uh, pretender because you have all these options to do, um, again, some of these are just because I have mods on um, that give more. Some of them are specific to each. They tend to go a... Uh, larger mythological group so like Ulm is kind of Germany so it gets like the Celtic god chassis I'm gonna use chassis uh one of the people I watch on YouTube refers to him that way and I will as well um uh, basically the uh types um so like you'll see things like you know like the Tiwaz of War is based on Celtic myth like the Allfather Odin if you know anything about Norse mythology. That one explains itself. It's all those. So there's those based on uh, the culture type, and then there's sometimes there's a few unique ones for a particular faction specifically. So like Ulm and Ulm alone gets access to these Black Steel Colossus and Black Steel Angel, um, which have their own things and are based off of. Do you have magic paths naturally? No, you don't. So I probably wouldn't go with that one. But, um... Sorry. I'm getting off topic. So there's the different chassis, which have different uh, innate dominion, which is complicated. Um, I'm not getting into too much, but uh, the categories... Uh, did I mention the YouTuber uh, who uses chassis? It's a general strategy, I think, is their name. I will actually pause the video and double-check that. Uh, no, it was General Confusion Plays, which, uh, I will probably link their Getting Strategy, uh, playlist, because it's a great way to get overviews of mechanics. And then he will go, he does have on that list, it's mostly him one at a time going through. He has one for all three alms, basically, of going over, like, here's the faction, here's their gimmick in this age, here's the god chassis you probably want to go for broken into four categories based on dominion. Dominion is basically how strong belief of you spreads, and um, the more dominion in an area, the more it's affected by uh, your scales, which I haven't gotten into yet, even though I keep saying it will, uh, and basically how strongly they believe. Um, one of the ways to wipe out a faction is to make sure that nobody else believes in it. So when you pick one, um, the broken into four categories, uh, he refers to the Dominion one ones, these are rainbows. Um, they're called rainbows because uh, they all have some magic, um, like the Strauss Father I just grabbed has uh, air and water, but then new magic path cost is 10 points. So like, as you can see, they each have a, on the bottom they each have a point value. So say I go Frost Father, that's 120, whatever the start points are, gone. And what that gets me is one path in air and water, I have 305 points left to spend, but then new path costs 10. What that does not mean, as you can see, that only went down eight by going up one. What that does mean is I can take one of these, like these ones that I don't have, and now I have one path and everything very cheaply relative, because if you look at some of these other ones, like let's grab the Son of Fenrir, new magic path cost 80. So if I were to try to do the exact same thing, with the Son of Fenrir, I'm now at minus 285 points. And that's why they're referred to as rainbows, is because that's their main draw. They are weak, they're, ca they're casters, and because you have a rainbow with pads on them, they can cast a lot of things. Um, I don't know what it is. 
is to blow. Okay, yeah, so it's hitting S on the keyboard pulls this off. And to throw magic around, I'm just scrolling around, but as you can see, there's a bunch of different paths showing up. Like, this is just one school of all of them, but it's like, you know, you need water this. Some of them need cross paths, like you need, like, to cast Ziz, which is a summoning a uh, undead great eagle, basically. You need death and air magic, which makes sense for that. Um, and lightning gargoyles, earth and air. Pyre of the Frozen Flame, Fire and Water. Um, I would never cast that spell with Ulm, but that's for a different faction, basically. Um, a different group of factions, I should say. And so, yeah, there's all these schools, which all have different magic setups. And so, a rainbow chassis can get you to find magic sites around the map. So, like, in addition to your uh, nation-specific ones, so it's not like... Okay, I'm Ulm, I only get Earth Gems. Every place you take has a chance set up once we get to the past character creation game screen of uh, having more magic sites. And so you can send someone with the relevant magic paths, and that is unfortunately a requirement to go to those provinces and do an action search for magic sites to see if you discover anything if your character has the relevant paths and it exists there, you discover these magic sites, and they typically give a couple gems. So, like, oh, uh, you can find, um, what's one off the top of my head? A uh, Lake of Living Water, for example, with a water mage. Um, I think you only need water one for that, but, uh, and that'll give you one water gem a turn. Um, and so a rainbow chassis like this has what wild character paths, and sometimes you'll have spells Ulm doesn't really in this age, unless it kept yeah, they don't have it in this age but there are some spells that are national spells that you can't necessarily cast naturally, and what I mean by that is like, well, for example, the Savior of Iron um, or Contact Iron Angel this is actually a good example of this so, you need four Earth, two Astral to cast Contact Iron Angel now, that is doable for Ulm via these uh, black priests have a chance. Um, very low chance, actually. I didn't realize it was that bad. Do I have the math? Are the master smiths better? No, they're not. That's only a 20% chance. I thought someone had, but yeah, so there is an actually a chance when you're recruiting these units. So that's the other thing is some of these will have a uh, random magic. Sometimes there's... So since there's a zero, there's no guarantees off of it. But like 10% of the guys you will recruit will have one path in one of these four magics in addition to that one earth. So 10%, like, so a quarter of that, so 2.5%, give or take, will have an extra level of earth and will be earth 2. Um, 2.5% will be earth 1, air 1, so on and so forth. Uh, that said, with that levels, it is very hard, unless you're churning out a lot of them, which with black priests, will be, unless you're going for Priestess instead, which is honestly a fair call. Um, they, uh, you won't have many that have Astral, and they appear, okay, so they have a better chance to have Astral, but that's still one level of it. That's nowhere near, uh, what you need for the contacting of the other nature. What you can do is grab a rainbow chassis, and then very cheaply, so... What did that need again? Let's double check. Scroll down. Well, first you need to research down to level 6, level 7, as the case is. Conjuration. Um, which will take a long time. Don't get me wrong. By the time... Like, it costs 25 Earth Gems to summon it. You can see the costs on the right. Uh, some don't have any. So, the Heart Worm, for example, is a, a spell that can be cast by a level 2 nature, level 1 death mage for no gems in combat. But all... All ritual ones that have this pentagram will have some cost. So, a mage that is for Earth to Astral can spend 25 Earth gems in a lab, which is a building you can build on the map, uh, to summon an Iron Angel commander. Um, the Iron Angel is very good, which is why it's Conjuration 7. But, um, very hard to get to um, natively, which is these guys. If you find like an astral mage uh, 
you have five Earth Gems a turn, it isn't too crazy to give them cross paths in Earth. But what you could do instead, and this is one of the reasons you grab a Rainbow Chassis, is I now just gave him straight out. You also want to have high level magics because you get bless effects, but we'll get into that after magic. Um, so now my god can cast that spell once we research down to Conjuration 7 and assuming we have 25 Earth Gems. We might not because Ulm does a lot of forging. We'll get into that. Um, but now I have someone capable of casting that spell, and it is a good spell. There are reasons for it. Um, also, in the custom game, it just changes your banishment and one other thing, I don't remember what it is, but there's a bunch of different variations based on which path your person is highest with. So, like, and it goes from left to right to the turn. So if I had four in everything, um, neat, that would give me four plus points in everything. Um, but it would pick, it would give me the fire, ashes to ashes, all this crap. Um, having said that, playing this middle age Ulm, I would not take a frost father per se. Ever. Because you are primarily an earth nation with some fire and some other things. So playing to your, playing to your strengths is, uh, ideal, but not necessarily required. Um, could go Stone Magus, um, could go, uh, the other things, uh, two, he refers, uh, General Confusion refers to them as the Expanders, um, these are the gods you want to grab if, more or less, their gimmick is, you grab them awake, and they can take territories on their own, basically, um, so we can do it right, like, the Normer, like, that's four attacks, three of them in melee. Um, this weapon will sometimes be used in melee instead of one of the other attacks as well for that ranged dragon gas attack. Um, things like that that will just kind of casually mulch through uh, independent defenders of provinces. Um, so that's what the Dominion 2 ones are overall. So Dominion 2 are expanders, Dominion 1s, the rainbow chassis. Dominion's 3 years titans. Um, they typically have a gimmick, is the way they go. Um, they're typically also Titan units or some or mythology equivalent Titans. Um, they typically they can do two is built sole Dominion two is built solely to do the expansion uh, or some other things in that regard. Um, like this has a Trinity meaning there's three parts of it. Um, and there's their stealthy ethereal things that, so basically it's a spy network as opposed to expansion directly per se, but things like Thricehorn Boar, Trample, Berserker 5, um, capable of going Berserk. What Berserk does is it adds to their, uh, attack skill and strength, um, and protection, I believe, um, while Berserk, it's like raging for a barbarian, um is functionally what it does. It makes them hit even harder. It's a large thing that tramples, meaning instead of uh, attacking, it will charge straight through and literally just run over and crush units. Um, and you'll notice most of the things are giant monsters like that. Um, Dog in the Underworld starts with ghosts. Some of them start with minions. Uh, he's a corpse eater. He gets extra health. Um, extra hit points if he can eat 20 corpses a turn, so that can bump his head points up to 132 at maximum, with some other bonuses. Um, yeah, these guys are designed to go out and take territory in your name. Um, I don't like doing that, personally. I, I hate, 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 hate putting that at risk, because, uh, if your god dies, you your god suffers penalties. You can get them back, but they suffer penalties from it. Um, the exception to that would be, like, for, for example, like, the Night Hunter. It's got blood. Um, you know, whatever paths you give, like, I'll just pick one up again. I'll grab the Phosphoth again. I'm just gonna hover on him, for examples. Like, you give him, like, whatever you want, magic-wise, 
I think there is a bottom limit, but for example, every time he dies, he loses a path in every single magic. Um, also, your dominion doesn't spread as much, things like that. Um, which, yeah, so like the pretender god will influence the surroundings. A strong dominion can weaken the dominions of enemy pretender gods. Um, again, all of these other things are affected by dominion. So, <clears throat> Whatever you do here, like, bump growth up to three. This one is nice. It tells you flat out, like, hey, here's what this does. Um, eventually get these effects. So, like, it'll increase the growth in a pop, uh, ugh, a province, a territory, whatever you want to call it. Um, provinces is what this game uses, so it's what I'm going to use. But um, I already don't have the points for this business. Um, all of these effects you do, so, like, you know in a best possible scales. You don't want to touch this. Um, this one is a uh, flavor thing. Like, there's factions like Abyssia that are made of lava people, or Kylum that are mountain bird people that have cold scale, like, that prefer one of these. Um, if you don't have it, like, this is the ideal scales. You will never have this, period. Um, don't care what your setup is. See, like, even if I did nothing but this, I'm 305. I would have to take Imprisoned, which means my god won't be around for three years, which is, uh... It's 12 turns per year, so around 36 turns my god will be around um, to get this. Um, that can be very, very problematic, because, again, while your god isn't around... Your dominion doesn't really spread. Um, it doesn't spread as well. You can still spread it, but not nearly as well. Um, he can't do anything because he's not on the map. Uh, it puts you very far behind. The only times you would do that is if you're actually going for one of these op top dominion four chassis, which are referred to as the immobiles, because a lot of them have the immobile trait. Um, this idol doesn't for some reason. Um, this idol can be carried around, I guess. But... Maybe they just got rid of that tray. Um, for gods. One of my mods might have done that. But these are noted as typically being unable to move. Um, their cost, pa cost paths are typically high. Um, they're the inanimates, so they're... They can't, like life drained or anything like that um as ancestral spirits he's the ancestral barrel this is a mod pretender but it doesn't matter um so ones that aren't like yerman sul is not is why i had that they typically have something going on and they all have this innate spellcaster, meaning they're always casting spells um so uh no matter what's going on like cast spells um never hindered from casting spells they disregard casting times, casting all spells at the same rate. Um, so this will always cast a spell around, basically. Um, there's some other stuff in there about communion, but that's that's an advanced magic thing. We'll get into that later. Um, same with that. Ivy Lord is a summoning thing. There are certain things that you can summon, and if they have this trait, they summon more of them. Um, but these start with Dominion 4, so right away you have that going for you. And typically they don't give you much else for their point cost. Because you'll notice, despite like the different dominions here, the costs on these are fairly comparable. Like Yearman's 170, Lord Mysteries 170, Thrice 104, 150, Solar 160, the Dragons 220. Like, the dominion number doesn't really matter that much. It more impacts what they bring to the table. Um, so since they don't bring much except the high dominion, you can go ahead and slap them and imprisoned for less. So like I do this, I've foregone any blessing for perfect dominion scales, and so my dominion is as nice as it can be at four dominion, which is the highest that's natural like that, but you can even take 
on the frost well or whatever. Awake. Drop the scales back down. Like, I don't know what the max limit for this is. Uh, 10, apparently. I think. Yep, 10. Because it doesn't go up more even if I have more points. So, that being said, 4 is respectable. Um, I see general typically bump it up to 5, 6. It doesn't really matter in this since I'm just playing myself to demonstrate the game right now. And I probably won't actually play this, so whatever, it's fine. Um, that said, uh, what is the game comes actually? Uh, it never heals because it's a statue. Uh, it's got two fist attacks that are very high damage because of that. Proc 21 because it's made of black steel, which is basically super armor. Um, it's affliction resistant, which is good. Um, afflictions are like a permanent damage that carries over between battles um, in addition to the actual hit point ones. So like for example, example afflictions are like he, he took a limp, he has a never healing wound, um, things like that where it's like limp, he moves at a half speed, like crippled moves at like two, has a movement of like fixed two. Which when you consider the, like the Sons of Fenrir has a combat speed of 30, less you know how slow that is. Granted, that's really um, but even though it's right, it's 20, so that's a tenth of that. Um, so yeah, you have your options. You have your, this is, these are the chassis, the Dominion 2 chassis you go for if you want to, quick, if you want to have your god awake and expanding immediately. Uh, Dominion 3, if you have a specific gimmick you want fulfilled. Uh, like the Tuaz is a good commander with fire and air. Um, and, uh, and combat will manifest gems to aid the spellcasting. So I think that means he actually does have spontaneous generation once battle starts. He is also a combat caster, so he can cast uh, spells in melee combat without being interrupted. Uh, not as good as innate spellcaster, but still good. Um, Master of the Forge, Titan of the Forge is the... Uh, Domain is the uh, three chassis you might actually want to take as all, because in addition to Earth Mate, it's Earth and Fire, which you are. Um, he is fire resistant, which is nice. He, his Forge bonus is a full twenty percent, so gems cost twenty percent less. So for a uh, like a Earth boots, which are a level two Earth uh, item that give you an extra boost in Earth magic, um, that would normally cost you ten Earth gems. It costs him eight. Which, again, stacks with other boosters as well. So if you have a Dwarven Hammer, which gives um, which gives a reduction, that reduction is then added to this reduction for even more reduction, and so on and so forth. Um, he has Master Smith, which, for the purposes of crafting magic items, he can add this ability to all magic paths he knows. So for the purposes of forging items, he's already a level 3 Earth Mage and a level 2 Fire Mage, which gives you access to fancier equipment, basically. Um, he also has that resource bonus. He is disease resistant 100, which effectively means he's immune to, his, it, to disease. He has affliction resistance. Um, all pretenders have those, I think, as part of the mods. Um, I think it's worthy pretenders as part of Dominion's Enhanced. But because this Titan of the Forge is based on Hephaestus, spoilers, um, he has a limp. So, yeah, his combat speed is produced to half, minus one attack and defense, map move minus four. Um, for things like that, where he really should never be leaving your capital anyway, that's not a big deal. That's ignorable. Um, something like that on a Dominion 2 chassis would make that chassis unplayable. Just period. Um, because your whole goal with that is to get out and do stuff. Um, and that's why, for example, this thing has spreads death. Will affect the growth level of the province he's located in. Doesn't really matter as much. It still matters, just not as much, because you want to be moving him around, so that won't really affect any particular province too much. Um, in exchange, you know, four attacks in combat um, per round. That's the thing, the dragons get all of these per round, which makes them pretty solid. Um, whereas, like, if he was stuck in melee, he'd have one attack per round. Again, Rainbow Chassis, you don't want him in melee, but the point stands. Okay. 
So once you've settled on your chassis, again, for all my think I am, just gonna go ahead. You now have it, anything that you have four points or higher in, um, you get a bless effect. There are some exceptions to that, uh, which are easiest to show with a rainbow, so I'll go ahead and do that. For example, if you take three in every single elemental path, now you have three points in all of them, but you need three in all three. And likewise, um, it's elemental and sorcery is how the game divides them. So these four are considered sorcery paths, and these four are considered elemental paths. If you have three in all of them, I believe it needs to be, yeah, you'll get three plus points. Um, but, again, there's re we'll get into why that's not necessarily something you want to go for in a second. So once you have that, you have these points to spend. Um, if you hit add bless effect, it'll show you the list of things you can buy. Um, you'll notice, again, like the highest level, there's the higher level ones have this thing called incarnate only. Basically that means that these bless effects you pick up will only affect blessed units while your god is alive. Which is another reason why you want to be really, really careful with your god. Because if for example, I'll bump him up to, for the purposes of this, uh, fire eight and grab flaming weapons. Tax and bless units will do six armor piercing fire damage in addition to everything else. And it counts as magical, I think. No, this one doesn't. That's an arcane thing where you can make it, you can give it magic weapons, which uh, is important because some things have traits like ethereal and whatnot, but they need magic weapons to be hit. Um, but, so, if you've done this, that, you need at least six points of fire to take that with all the point cost that goes into that, and that only affects your units when your god's alive. So if your god dies, or you take him dormant, or imprisoned, so dormant is they're gone for the first year of the game, um, which is the first 12 turns, basically. Um, there's some leeway. With Dormant, it's like one turn. With Imprisoned, it's like three or four turns in either direction. So he might show up on turn 11. He might show up on turn 13. Um, on Dormant, Imprisoned, it's 33 to 39, I think. I could be wrong about that. I don't really play with uh, Imprisons. And to hear General Confusion tell it, by that point, the game's more or less decided on multiplayer. But... So all the point cost that goes into that, so for example, let's drop all this just so we can showcase that. So that's a hundred and some points. Right there, yeah, that was 120 points just to get this flaming weapons. That only is effective if your god's on the field. If your god dies, this is gone. You've essentially wasted that if you were going for the bless. Now, six fire magic is obviously useful for other things. Not a lot, because fire is a bad path to demonstrate that, but that's that's why I tend to avoid these chassis, um, and why I tend to avoid trying to use my god to expand in general, is because there's so much you can waste. And then again, if you, whatever you do, you can only affect the bless now by the way. So, like, if you say, grab fire shoot, whatever. Um, for example, if your god, you know, in the game you can empower, which, uh, you spend gems to, uh, make them innately a higher path of magic. So, like, if, say, he's 6'4 and you, uh, empower him to Earth 5, you don't get a new bless point. You don't get to tweak your bless mid-game. Which is why picking magic paths now is important. Um, you can still get around them. Like, if you want to do something else, like, again, like, that spell I went over earlier, that Contact Iron Angel that needs Astral, or Savior of Iron is basically a mid-battle summon version of it, but lower level costs. So say I want to cast this, um, okay, that's... I don't know what that's actually setting it off on. Probably Astral, actually. <clears throat> yeah looks like it. Um, but, so say I want to cast that, I can empower him with Astral later, those two levels of Astral, that's fine. And I can take the fourth now, and that'll actually give me a blessing. 
So it's not important now that he, that if I need a pretender to cast that spell, that my pretender has an astral. It will be tricky if I don't, because again, I'd need to rely on one of those random astral, uh, either mage smiths, who I don't want to have going on safe searching anyway, or uh, black priests, who I can't afford to send out searching, um, but have a lower chance to have that astral. I would need to send them out to find an astral site to get, well, to get astral gems so I can empower him. Convoluted mechanics, we're kind of getting away from my points, but it's less important if you're trying to set up a spell. Still important, but less important. Astral is a bad one for that, too, because you can find a lot of independent mages out in the provinces that you can recruit, because each territory on the map has a set uh, list, and some magic sites also allow the recruitment. So if you run into, say, there are some barbarian tribes, they're literally just called like wolf tribe, deer tribe, jaguar tribe, what have you, in a province, those are typically led by shamans, which is a great way. So like, for example, wolf tribe shamans are nature and something else. So if you build a lab in that province, you can recruit those wolf tribe shamans, and that'll get you into those paths as well. So making so if you're trying to set up spells, it's less important that your god has it. Um, still can be important if you're trying to base your strategy around it, but not as important as, say, making sure you have a reasonable dominion, uh, decent scales, um, and uh, a decent bless. Um, so I could go with my cur current setup. Uh, I could go. Ulm doesn't have sacreds, actually. If we go back over, like the the priests are priests are considered sacreds, but like nothing else, nothing in my actual roster. Black iron infantry are. The reason you want the Iron Angels, in addition to being um, everything this is, um, a Black Steel Angel also allows you to recruit these boys, which are basically your infantry, only better and with magic swords, um, as an as a unit, not as a commander. Um, but yeah, the only sacred things in Ulm are the priests. Um, which makes bless less because sacreds are the only things you can bless. So since Alton doesn't have units to bless, uh, the blessing doesn't really matter. The blessing is only relevant for your god. Whatever you make your prophet. We'll get into that later. And your priests as all. So bless, not that important for all. For other factions like Mitt. McClin, which I didn't pick, but uh, they're basically the Aztecs. Their entire battle plan is sacreds and summons. So for them, having a good bless is critical. Not really the case for Ulm. Uh, not really something I have to worry about. Uh, so whatever I do here doesn't really matter. I might honestly just go... Uh, Reinvigoration three times. Because Reinvigoration is a uh, casting spells and whatnot in battle. I'm going to evocations because there's a lot of evocation spells for combat. Pull them up. They have their own things like range, how long it takes to cast. 100% is one round. Um, area of effect, one person. So, like, if I cast Iron Darts, it's only going to hit one person per effect, which is three plus if you hover over that. That's two more per level above. So Iron Darts is one Earth and one Priest level, so only uh, Iron Priests and Priest Smiths can cast the spell. Um, but for every level of Earth higher, so like if I the Priest Smiths who have two Earth levels, they throw five instead of three because they're one level higher, so three plus two. Um, the fatigue cost of this is low, um, but like each one costs ten fatigue. Uh, minus, it's cut in half if you're level 2. Um, higher levels mean you 
take less fatigue from it. But um, at 100 fatigue, it's, it's basically a percentage. At 100 fatigue, the person passes out and needs to recover for a round. Um, so, you know, the, the upgraded version of that, if you get all the way down to like level 6 research, uh, Iron Blizzard, that's half. Halfway there. Probably 25 if you're using pre-smiths, which you should be. Um, because, it, again, it cuts in half if it's if they're above. But forecasts of the spell, even if you're a higher level, and you're passed out, basically. You, you recover some, uh, some fatigue naturally, but still, five casts put you down. Reinvigoration 3 makes you recover an extra 3 fatigue around to your blessed units. Which, again, is only my priest mages. And, my god. Which, I won't be doing anything combat-wise, so it doesn't really matter. Um, which actually makes fire a really useless bless path for me. Um, could go major fire resistance, I guess. So, other fire mages won't hurt me. Um, actually, I could bump that up and take, like, fire shield or something. Um, that's not a bad idea, actually. Fire shield. Um, it's another one of those incarnate only, so if my god dies, this goes away, but... Busted units get a shield of fire around them. Anyone stri trying to strike them will take fire damage, basically. Um, up to seven armor-piercing damage of fire if they try to attack my mages, so make them a little tankier in addition to the extra not die and the extra uh, fatigue recovery. And now I'm only left with 45, which is kind of a problem. Because um, you need 40 to adjust scales in any way. Um, take misfortune. So yeah, like there's negatives and positives. There's luck three, and then there's misfortune three. Everything caps out at three, which is why uh, some people don't mind. And the temperature one is a unique scale. Um, wow, this is already over an hour, and we haven't even gotten to the actual map yet. Good lord. Um, I knew it would be this bad. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. Um, so. These, so the five around, uh, Order Turmoil, Productivity Sloth, Growth Death, Fortune Misfortune, Magic and Drain, all of these have a distinct positive side and a distinct negative side. Temperature does not, because it's all based on your faction. Uh, all, they'll tell you right away in this race if they prefer a certain scale, and it'll automatically adjust My mouse sometimes double clicks on its own, um, unfortunately. I'm gonna just pull that back as it was. No, not Hedora. Um, useful for some nations, not for us. Um, Hedora literally makes it super hot around your people. It can set people around them on fire. It can, it will cause extra fatigue, things like that. My people are not protected from that. It would not be a good idea. Um, but yeah, so order turmoil. These five, not counting temperature, all have a distinct positive and negative side. Um, one or the other does. Uh, again, temperature, since there's nothing on saying on here, that means Ulm prefers a temperature scale of zero. And so, if you'll notice, bump it up to heat. Heat three, cuts income and supplies. I drop down to cold three, same drop. Now temperature is a bit weird because it does fluctuate with the seasons. So for example, if the scale is zero in summer, at the very least the middle of summer, possibly early and late summer, um, it's heat one at least, maybe even heat two if there's something else going on there. And then in winter it's cold one. Um, so while it's those seasons, it's already there, meaning this is already applying except for in spring or fall. Um, now what that means is, when you completely cap it on one side or the other, it can never go higher than three in either direction. So for example, if you have it set to three heat, in summer, it's still gonna be three heat. And when it's winter, it's actually gonna drop down to two heat. Um, so what this means is if you're going to adjust this scale 
for extra points because it's 40 per scale tip um go all the way just go all the way it's functionally the same penalty a quarter of the year is this um and a quarter of the year will be that um so it's effectively 50 percent not as bad um for 40 more points like it's a half a scale effect for a full scales tip elsewhere um now alm for example because alms shtick in the middle age is very very heavily armored units this is literally the highest it, a unit's protection will be in the game is 23 um the trade-off is the resource cost relative to everything else for these is astronomical uh so with ulm you never ever want to take sloth because it cuts resources by 15 percent per scale that sawing logs for sloth haha <laughs> um and the hammer of industry for so alternatively you really do want productivity because each one is plus 15 percent resources which is for you huge there's also some income that comes in from that, but it's nowhere near compared to that. So you might want to take some order as well. Order is extra recruitment point. Some resources, not nearly as much as productivity. Um, and it drops and it helps your income. Now with Ulm, Ulm has some nice things. Again, their researchers are mundane researchers. So normally research comes from the magic paths they have. Um, so three magic paths, 11 research uh, in this case. It's like base six and then plus some based on the paths. I don't know the exact number. I could probably calculate it out, but I don't feel like it. Um, some of them don't, but all the smiths have it. The uh, black priests do not have it, but your pre-smiths, which is honestly them and the master smiths is what you want a lot of anyway for the forge bonuses. They have mundane researcher, so they won't be hindered by a drain scale in any way. So what that means is I can tick all the way down to drain. Um, and you'll notice the only thing it really did is cut research points down by three. So what that means is in my domain with that up, a black priest, for example was giving me seven points of research, it would now be giving me four. And that would be the case for everyone, except for this mundane researcher trait. So for these guys, who I would be spamming for research anyway, just because the higher research, and since they're priests, it's, they still have low upkeep. If they do that per year, that's 70 gold every 12 turns, um, basically. Every when we actually get in game, the income will have a little in parentheses minus whatever because that's minus what your actual upkeep is for per turn um, of all your stuff combined. It's a lot more intuitive on the map, that part of it anyway. Um, so, again, they have mundane researcher, so they don't care, and you're going to want to be making a lot of these anyway. So, Ulm is penalized a lot less for dropping this all the way down to drain three. Um, it will get you the stink eye from your neighbors because they are affected and they don't like it. But tough. Um, again, I'm talking multiplayer, something I don't do. But <laughs> um, growth is good because that's actually how you get populations to rise. Um, and again, by taking drain three, these two completely cancel each other out. At, in terms of point cost, because that's plus 120 points, minus 120 points. Um, again, I popped the uh, peak cold scale all the way to cold, just just because I'm Germanic, it makes more sense. Um, so I still have enough points to, say, either bump myself up to level 7, I don't really care about bless though, so I'd actually be more concerned with uh, bumping productivity. And so this is a perfectly serviceable scale setup for all the productivity is huge because again the most protected infantry in the game these guys are great because tower shields are basically extra defense against arrows for the most part um, but 
they also have some of the best crossbows in the game, because they have an Arbalest, which is range 50. Granted, they only fire once every three rounds, but, um, yeah. Still very good, and then Sappers have regular crossbows if you want. The one every two rounds with a range of 40. Um, it's also, did the Arbalest have more precision now? The same precision. Combat, you don't actually control per se in this, but we'll get into that later. Um, standard forts, but Master Masons, that's this unit here, in addition to having siege bonus, so he counts as 30 men for the purposes of sieging a fort, and 20 men for the purposes of defending a fort. He also has this Mason trait, which lets you build castles that are one level higher than you normally can, basically. So if your forts cap out at citadels, or like castles, um, if it caps out of castles, you can build citadels with the Master Mason. Um, things like that is what that trade is. But So this is a perfectly serviceable setup for Alm. And I'll have my god from turn one with this. If I wanted to mess with my scales more, I could have taken him dormant. Bumped that up to three productivity and three order probably is what I would have done. Alternatively, I could give myself a point of misfortune to give myself a point of order. Um, points of order actually work really well for this. Because, um, like, for example, order reduces the rate at which events happen, and either direction of fortune increases the rate that events show up, and as well as affecting whether or not they'll be good or bad events. Um, so this setup, also perfectly serviceable. I don't like min-maxing. I prefer closer to the even, so I'd probably keep it this way. Um, but yeah, this is a perfectly serviceable setup of, for a god of. And when you hit OK, you can name your god. Like I said, the chassis is based off of Festus. So think of that one. But we'll call him Tim. Some who call me Tim. And then you get to the next person, so like Agartha. Gartha has heavy infantry as well, but you'll notice even their heavy infantry, which is good heavy infantry for the era. 22 resources. 27 resources. Not the 40-something that all of them sport. Heck, even their giant ancient ones that have thrown boulders um, don't cost. Only cost 27 resources. Um, their sacreds, and they do have sacred units, so for them a bless is a bit more important, um, what well, can be if you plan to use units. I don't know enough about each faction to know which units I should or shouldn't be using. That's part of my problem. Um, this game is a lot of trial and error. Um, but, so, sacred troops uh, can be blessed and only require half usual cost, so if you go to their morale, obviously commanders cost more than units make sense. You'll have more units in commanders. Um, but they cost, like, for example, this Oracle of the Ancients is a priest, and so is sacred. And the upkeep is still pretty high in this one. That's more than 10 bucks a turn. Um, I think that's 14 a turn, actually. <laughs> Yikes. Um, but that means instead of being Ship below that is useful. 150 a year if they weren't sacred for basically if they had everything else but weren't sacred for some reason, um, like they were heretics instead or something. Uh, heretics is a thing where it's basically opposite priest. Um, so, whereas sacred priests spread your dominion, heretics uh, get rid of your dominion at that priest level. Um, not something you want, but can be useful in certain situations. Um, and not something most factions have to deal with, only some have heretics, but, uh, so for a mage of this quality, uh, it would be 300 if it wasn't sacred, which is nuts. Um, so like, as you can see, this one has a 100% chance of getting one of those, so it says random one, but then there's a 10% chance to get another one of these, and these two, when it's like this, they're not linked, so if the 100% chance turns out to be death, say, 
that 10% chance one could That said, these are good mages. Um, Earth 3 is very useful in terms of forging and everything else, though they don't have forging bonus, but this one does have fortune teller. Has a chance to prevent bad events. Um, however, that one's capital only. Um, but they're Earth readers. They're basic mages that are sacred, so yeah, the upkeep on them's not terrible. Um, I think that was, yeah, that's like two... Uh, actually less than two shard guardians upkeep so not bad there um but they have fortune teller which means they can prevent bad events so for an agarthan faction it's not as bad to take misfortune because you can stack especially since earth readers are so cheap you can stack earth and their recruit anywhere with a lab and a fort um so you can just spam these out and have them all over the place and each one and fortune teller stacks so if you just have a bunch of them everywhere they'll negate all the bad events that taking misfortune would give you basically so for agartha this is perfectly fine for some factions this is terrible either because their heroes which is a good event are very good for their faction or just because you know you don't want crap happening all the time don't have fortune teller uh, that going all the way down can be very very bad um, okay. but if you just have earth readers which are very cheap very efficient you'll want a lot of these for research anyway mages have fortune teller you, you'll have them everywhere you care about basically um, but yeah like a lot of these don't require as much like wet ones. They're amphibious, so you can take them underwater. Um, that's really the main draw of, uh, of your Agarthans or your soldiers. Um, Middle Age Agartha, no real ranged option, aside from Ancient Ones and Ancient Ones Stone Curlers. And they're not particularly good ranged units in that. That's a problem, yeah. So, wet ones, uh, that's just wet ones with armor. Uh, so, Agarthans have these pale ones, is basically what the faction's based off, like subterranean giants, basically. Um, but the Agarthans, the smaller ones, have some underwater colonies, which is why they'll show up in other some other factions, and can show up underground in general. Um, And so they can actually build forts underwater. That's like land factions, unless specified, like Agartha is one of them. Uh, late age, at least Mitklan, Mitklan, Mitklan. I, I don't know if the T or C is first. Uh, is one because they get access to Atlanteans. Factions with underwater units or amphibious units typically can build underwater forts. But if you don't have anything with the amphibious trait, like these guys, or these guys, or these guys, you can't build underwater forts. You can still build underwater labs and temples, like if you give, uh, say, an earth breeder, because they need to have priest levels, or be sacred at least, to recruit, um, to build a temple. Um, and they need to be magical to build a lab. So if you give one of those, like, a ring of water breathing in one of his two miscellaneous slots, he can go underwater and build a temple in the lab for you. Um, wet ones are not sacred, so they don't need that, per se. Um, but still. And so, like, for these, for example, Agartha, this roots of the earth, three earth gems, one fire gem. All the oracles. Earth mage can scry. That's basically letting you spy on a territory six territories out from your capital. Um, it's also where all these ancients are coming from. Um, and then there's the uh, Chamber of the Broken Seal, which gives you access to shard guards. Um, again, lore for days, and there is 
the lore is dense and connected. Like, Agartha is one of the nations that spans from early to late. Late has access to crossbows, but a lot of people have access to crossbows then. Um, but this gives you death gem. So, already, without having to find any sites on the map, you've got three earth, one fire, one death gem. Not bad. You also have a bless bone. So, like, they'll say things like this. Like, um, dark vision, extra golden resources, and cave forts. Um, so, forts give you more income, more everything, but it also draws from the surrounding. For forts built in caves for Agartha, because their whole thing is they were uh, cave people, um, the pale ones originally, um, they get extra resources for it. Um, and they have some descriptions, military, like heavy infantry, troglodyte slaves. Um, slaves usually have very low morale, but they have drug any salary or expensive food and have halved upkeep costs, so Slaves are low morale. In this case, since it's a trampler, it has high gold cost, like no resource cost, good recruitment point cost. But actually, this morale is not bad, especially for a slave. But yeah, the upkeep's only 20 gold a year. Whereas this basic infantry is seven. Okay, so poor example of slaves there, but that's what it is. Oh, very poor example, because it has average morale is 10. It's base 12 even being a slave, so that's a really poor example. But powerful priests. Um, not every faction has access to uh, Holy Three. Um, does not. Most typically only have access to two. Uh, three is reserved for prophets, and some factions that have powerful priests. These guys. Um, they can do extra things on the campaign map and are important in spreading your uh, god's dominion. What they can do on the map we'll get into when we get into game modes. Um, this is just going to be one very, very long episode, and for that I apologize. But there's a lot to get through when it gets into setting up this game, which is why problems exist in this game. Um, so right away, gem income. Uh, I have earth mages, I have lots of earth mages. I have some fire and water mages, so I might want to get a couple of these to go sight searching to break me into water. Um, the reason I don't want to make a lot is they are old. Old is actually a mechanic in this game where, you know, as people get old, they get more frail. They sicken easier, they have all these things like their strength goes down, attack and defense goes down. Encumbrance goes up. Encumbrance basically affects fatigue. Um, like, encumbrance, how, how fatigued do you get from one round of melee combat? Um, Spellcasting encumbrance is basically the same deal with one round casting spells. So every turn this guy does something, he'll take four fatigue. Is the net, I think, is what that is. Um, yeah, as the fatigue increases, it becomes easier to hit. Hitting a weak spot in their retired mammoth. The seeds 100, the unit falls, stays drunk, comes to the ground. Basically, if you fall unconscious, you are dead. Um, give me the death. Yep. Units automatically uh, yeah, co recover one point of fatigue each combat round, or five if they're already unconscious. Um, so the nets, three fatigue every round of combat. Granted, combat will never last 36 rounds. But that's on top of the fatigue cost of spells he's casting in this case, um, and everything else. So, low encumbrance, good, high encumbrance, bad. And also, old aged people get afflictions over time, and uh, including diseased, which means they just die. Um, you, you want to avoid disease like, well, you want to avoid the plague like the plague. Wild, I know. Um, but, yeah, it, it actually is that bad in this game. Like I said, it's like Pathfinder. Horribly complicated, but you can do a lot with it. But, and there's a lot of stuff to watch out for. But, Plague is one of those things you don't really have to watch out for. It's only if you do stupid things that your army gets sick and dies. Um, yeah, so right away, 
three earth, one fire, one death. That means I know I'm good for those paths. And so, yeah, as you can see, the uh, list of god jazzies is greatly different for me than it was for as a Gartha than it was for me as a Hulk. Um, example, while I, m I still have access to some of the rainbow chassis, I also have this new leader of the council. These are new. I don't have access to like the thrice horned boar or the sons of Fenrir. Still have that Titan of the Forge though. Um, could just make seven of them and name them all Spartacus. Um, no. But yeah, so each one has their own setups. Uh, Risen Oracle, Earth Death. Not really an expander, so I don't like. Well, he's immortal, is probably what it is. So immortality is something you'd think being a god would make you immortal, but you'd be wrong um, in this game. So if an immortal dies, it'll rise from the dead and return to the problem. So basically, if this thing dies in three months, it will be back in the capital, still with all its magic paths, and will get rid of most afflictions. So, with immortals, the whole kill yourself isn't a bad call. Um, yeah, so uh, the Olms can summon things. Uh, Olms were the ruling race of Agartha in the early age, and so this is basically uh, one that has survived. Um, is paralyzed? I don't know what that does, because it doesn't really say, it just says R100, and that it's special. And that the special is psychic damage, so it's one damage, I guess. Um, range 100, attack 100, area of effect 5, so it does something. <laughs> what? I don't know, but it does something. But yeah, and so some chassis have different slots. So, for example, he is basically just a giant lizard with tiny feet and tiny hands. He has two hand slots, two miscellaneous slots, and that's it. So you can't equip a helmet on him. You cannot equip a uh, curious on him. You can't equip the chest armor on him. You can't give him boots. Um, whereas, say, a Cyclops, this is the unit standard number of gear options. A uh, weapon, shield, helmet, chest piece, boots, and then two miscellaneous. Um, that being said, there are two-handed weapons, which would take both of these slots, etc., etc. Um, trying to think. I don't really play Agartha much, so I don't really know what's good here. The Earth made flesh. Not by Earth made flesh, manifest math. Earth. So it sounds like he gets combat gems. He has regeneration, which is nice. He has siege bonus. He has recuperation. Heals its afflictions over time. And then that, but that goes away once it gets old. You'll notice the age for God chassis is ridiculous. If your God gets old age, you have been playing. Again, it's well, it's 12 turns per year. That's almost 1,500 years. Yeah, you're fine. Um, that's. You will never play that many turns in this game. You will get sick of it, scream, and run away before that point. Um, Yonic statue. So one of the things to look for also, since I don't play a Garth, I'll grab a rainbow for now because it's unimportant right now, is each one has these spells in blue. These are national spells. So basically, only some nations have access to these spells. Every nation has access to the ones in white. So everyone assuming they can get a mage of the correct path so anyone with access to a level 2 death mage can cast raise dead and enchantment level 4 things like that but only some i say some because there's some overlap like for example living mercury here um each other the oracles of the deeper earth aka agartha and the alchemists of tian chi have discovered the means to distill and animate liquid silver of the deeps. Mercury is an inherently magical substance, so just blah blah blah. Um, basically, it turns it creates something with mercury, which is basically a elemental that also does poison. I think it is because mercury is incredibly poisonous, wild. Um, 
So that one's a good example of one that some nations, plural, have. Meanwhile, things like the Grama Guard. This is a Gartha. Uh, left by the ancient ones, guns worshipped by the humans. Statues left in the hall underneath are worshipped, chanted, and given magical life by the Gaunt Crafters. Not strictly necessary. Anyone or three can do it, so the ancient ones can do it as well. Uh, if it was actually a requirement and not just uh, flavor things, it would say can only be cast by on there. Like Tian Chi has some where like they're some of that. Some of what I'm getting into is also because of the mods I have. I have actually, if we back all the way out, um, I'd have to hit OK through this, so I'm not gonna worry about it now. But at the start, in the upper right, over right where my mouse is, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but um. There's a list of what mods you have, and have on. I have Dominions Enhanced, which is a bunch of quality of life stuff, like the Protean Abomination is one of theirs. A bunch of these, these Idol of the Harvest. Things that are blatantly art pieces um, are from the Dominions Enhanced mod. Um, and it basically reworks the game to make it, in my mind, more interesting and more playable and quicker, which is very nice. Um... It doesn't really play with the costs of spells much in this area, but it does affect it for forging. Um, so, Enliven Sentinel, uh, flavor-wise, the Golem Crafters do this, but uh, any Earth Mage with any level two Earth Mage with three Earth Gems can cast Enliven Sentinel. So every turn you can cast this, just from what you have in your capital. Um, Living Mercury would be trickier because you don't have any water gems native. Uh -oh. Live in Granite Guard, any level 3 Earth Mage with 12 Earth Gems, you can summon a Granite Guardian. Uh -oh. Basically, the TLDR and Hall of Statues, once you get all the way down to level 8, which takes a very long time uh, in game turns, by that point, a level 5 Earth Mage, you'll have that. Uh -oh spend 30 earth gems to summon 20 plus so if it's higher than five you get four extra for every level higher so level seven mage we get 28 uh sentinels so it's basically a cost effective mass summon version of summon Sen of enlightened sentinel so whereas this is three for one at that point it's three for two if not more um so yeah, there's things like that. Conjuration, everyone typically has some, some stone power. Uh, okay, so... That's the same thing as summon earth power, which is later. I think it's like three. It's... Where is it? I don't think it is. Earth power, yeah it is. Okay, so it's effectively a level three... So level zero is things you have at the start of the game, regardless of level. Some nations, like Agartha, has it here. Um, typically the only ones, like, Evocation is... I think Evocation of maybe... The yeah, Thaumaturgy has Sleep Ray. Does Enchantment have any? No. But yeah, only some paths have... Yeah, Construction is important, because that's... Uh, a level how you can forge magic items needs construction levels um, to get better stuff. But... So, these guys have some stone power level zero, which can only be cast in caves, but it's functionally in caves the exact same spell as this one without having to research any levels of conjuration. Normally, you'd need to get, you'd need to research three levels of conjuration, and it's an exponential scale cost, unfortunately. But, so, like, I typically go on very easy research just to quickly research everything so I can keep testing and playing with things. Um, at that point, it's like level 1 is 20, 40, 80, 160, 320, so on and so forth. Um, research. And so, each mage, each... Uh, Earth Reader, for example, contributes seven research at a time. You start to see why that'll take a while. Um, 
So having that is nice that at least even in caves, you can off the bat do that. Um, as opposed to having to research down to do it. You also have unique summons um, at the roots of the earth. Um, sometimes national spells will be specific. Like these are summon spells. Um, a lot of times you know, those will have it. Apparently not these, but cats on water, but whatever. Um, some, like, again, those packs can only be cast at the roots of the earth, so you can only cast that ritual in the capital once you have it researched. Um, sage can only be cast, some can only be cast in caves. Um, that'll be true of some, for spells, that'll be true regardless, too. There's some, uh, like, uh, let me as some of them, it's just symbols can't be cast under water. Some do need, uh... I want to find something. Wild Hunt is not it, but, um... I can't find one when I need it, apparently. Um... It's like some of them can only be cast in certain, like... A lot of the nature summons, um, just obviously none of the ones I've hit, because I'm magical at that, but yeah, like, nope, that one is fine too, okay. Um, let's do this, I'm learning and guessing these, by the way, I don't actually know the key bindings to super filter like I'm doing, <laughs> I look like I know a lot more than I actually know about this game. Um, I think living castles can only target friendlies. No, it doesn't say. Can only be, yeah, so like this can only be cast under water. Um, a lot of the times the, uh, reason why will be made obvious with the description. So like, for example, that, uh, where was it? Living castle can only be cast under water because it's conjures a castle of Kelpin algae. Which is all underwater plants, so it makes sense. Call of the Wild, someone's werewolf in a large pack. Werewolves aren't amphibious, so you can't cast it underwater or target underwater with it. Some things are like that. Some factions have things that can be cast in forests. Some specifically in caves, like the old all that stuff. Uh, I don't think. Yeah, I don't really want. To. I don't have to worry about that. Yeah, blood magic. You either are a blood nation or are not, and blood magic works differently to the rest. Um, we're not worrying about that right now because it's not really the same. So I'll go ahead and just grab one. Yeah, and there's that extra earth point, so because it says I have extra earth bless points, despite the fact that I'm only a level four in earth, I have five earth bless points. Oh. I want to take a rainbow if I'm taking a rainbow. Um, so I want to, want to do something like this. Um, there's a few, a few ways you can play a rainbow. Um, there's no real reason if it's only 10 points to not take every path. So that way, worst case scenario, you can site search. Um, bump him up there. Um, as for what you need, growth is always good. Uh, can't take drain like I did as all because nothing had mundane researcher and that would actually hurt when it comes to getting higher level spells, which you want. Again, even if for no other reason, some of them are just more efficient mass versions of lower level spells. Um, earth, some fire, water, and death, mostly earth. Um, so the important thing is to have good earth magic. Um, you already will have that, but it's still. Um, the reason you do this is when it's a rainbow is it's only 10 points and each, having a new path gives extra research. I don't know what the algorithm is for research, but it gives you more than just upping it by one level of one you already have. So this is... 
basically making your god more efficient. Um, this one is an inspiring researcher, so that's important. But like, yeah. So now I have access to, and there are some, some blesses. I either need cross paths, so like I need fire and death blast points to give my people wasteland survival. Um, alternatively, some things need scales. So for example, this. Uh, I need to have taken death two, and have two death bless points to give myself the half dead blessing, which basically makes them sort of undead. Um, all sacred dudes are semi undead. They don't need to eat, and they have disease resistance, um, which is always active and doesn't require they be blessed. So that can be useful if you've taken death, especially because if you're taking death, you're losing population. And you're um, not as badly as if you were Aramor or something that specifically does that anyway, but you're still losing population. And the supplies, which is basically the uh, amount of units a province can have in it before your army starts suffering diseases, uh, goes down as the population goes down. So if you're killing your pops, eventually they will reach zero. It is unlikely that it will actually get that bad, but it will still especially if you're already at death too, be significant enough that you will be losing supply. So having that basically means your sacreds won't be bothered if you run out of supply. Which could be useful. I don't think it ever would be. I don't think it would ever be worth it, I should say. Um, maybe Abyssia, because Abyssia has a thing that growth and death scales only affect it half as much. But at that point, you wouldn't really be taking death. They, they aren't a death faction. Um... Alternatively, you could just to throw people off. Um, one of the nice things is that out of death is withering weapons, which gives every blessed unit uh, weapons that cause decay on hit, which is basically super fast aging. Um, it's typically what I go for if I only do some death. Um, actually, no, because aren't they? Okay, yes, yeah, so Agarthans are cold blooded, get exhausted very quickly before they go cold. So you never want to tip this to cold. You might shrug and go warm. That wouldn't be as bad. Take some water to mitigate that. Um, so, like, this is perfectly serviceable. Um, again, this doesn't hurt you as much because of all the fortune tellers you have, which can mitigate bad events. Unit 3, it's only a 30% chance to 30% tilt lower on the scale. I don't know how bad that is exactly, but... And for example, since I am doing this God Awake, uh, hard skin isn't that bad because that gives extra protection, plus 5 nat proc, so before armor, plus 5 protection to all sacred units that are blessed, um, which your God always is, so my God always has all these effects. Um, take mountain survival while I'm at it. I'm pretty sure... No, they don't. Okay. Then, yeah. Well, they're in the caves, not on the mountains, so I guess that makes sense. And then I've just got uh, four, f so... Yeah, sacred commanders. And that's just flat out they get, so... Sure, why not? They don't need to be blessed for that. So this is... <clears throat> in my eyes at least, workable. Again, I don't play a Garth much, so I don't know precisely how workable this is, but I think it's workable. I think I've got enough to bet on it anyway. So we have this Sambo. Sure, why not? Once you've gotten all the players set up, now you get options on game settings. How many provinces do you start with? Defaults. <clears throat> this is the perfect default. You saw me flip to it. Um, I typically like bumping up starting provinces and bumping down independent strength. Um, typically to zero if I'm just playing with myself to test stuff, because at zero, it's exactly what it sounds like. There's nobody anywhere, so you can just run in and grab. Um, versus of this, I'll leave that. Um, special site frequency. Um, it only goes up to 75 and can drop all the way down to zero. <laughs> Why you would ever want to play is... You, well... You'd want to play a zero if you want to test units, or if, you know, you're playing a faction you know for a fact has good units. Like, you do this, 
if you're playing as Alm against Mikla. Uh, that's when you just want to let... Like, you want it when you know your units are better. And you just want to rub it in the face of some other faction that is around you. Um, like Miklan. But Miklan actually isn't as punished by that because Blood Slaves, which is the gem, quote-unquote, for blood magic, work differently. Uh, multipliers, if you just want to not worry about these things, they go all the way up to 300%. Um, if you just don't want to worry about resources, bumping these up to 300% will take care of you. Um, again, if you want to just test giant battles, see what you can do. And when I say giant, I'm not talking, like, some of those leadership values, the basic commander leadership value can carry 80 units with them. And there's no upper limit on how many you can have, in theory. Supply multiplier makes that less practical for living armies, and only living armies. Hint, hint things like Aramor, Sclera, and Katis that revolve around summoning a lot of undead things don't actually care. Uh, now the undead have their own weaknesses, but there is absolutely nothing stopping an undead faction like Aramor from just showing up in a province with literally 5,000 skeletons led by the appropriate number of commanders because they hate you and want you to die. Away. Nothing stopping them whatsoever. Um, that's how big the battles in this get. Um, <clears throat> and any undead focused faction can do that pretty easily. Uh, I wasn't even really trying that much on my Katis, uh, games, and I ended up attacking the place <clears throat> with 533 skeletons, plus led by two skeleton commanders, uh, led by a Bane Lord and, uh, a uh, fancy undead lizard. Yes, that is actually a statement you can make with this game. I, I won with a fancy undead lizard. Um, but yeah, and then you can adjust things in the game. Um, Thrones of Ascension was new in Dominions 4. Uh, you can do the old, old standards. Con conquer all. Just kill the other people on there. You don't need to take every province, but you do need to kill all the other players. Um, victory by Dominion, uh, Dominion score, one converted province equals 11 to 20. Okay, so you can set that to whatever the heck you want. Um, alternatively, just 100, which seems low, but yeah. Number of provinces. You can go up to 500, but the problem with this is, uh, I'm pretty sure I have this set to only a 40 province map. So if you do a bunch of those, you're... SOL, and then research. How many research points do you need to have done total? And for example, and this this one actually provides a good scale. 7,100 points are required to research one school to level 9. So I assume this is research literally everything. Um, and then again, Conqueror All Thrones, but Thrones of Ascension. The way thrones work, um, Level 1 Thrones, yeah, claiming a throne, it says on the bottom, requires a Pretender, Disciple, or a Level 3 Priest. Now, you'll notice Agartha has one of those, Ulm does not. How do you get around that? Uh, since this is not a Disciple game, you can't do this in Disciple games, uh, what you can do is you can declare one commander of any kind that you control as your Prophet. And what that does is automatically makes that commander, commander, not priest specifically, can be anyone, it makes that person a level 3 priest. As well as giving him extra dominion spread bonuses and some other things. So what that means is you can declare someone your prophet to claim these thrones if your god is unavailable. Um, alternatively, as a Garthy, you can just crap out those uh, oracles of the ancient ones. And those don't need to worry about anything. They can just do it. Um, and so thrones are broken into three levels. Um, each throne has perks related to the specific throne. Um, and each one is worth a certain amount. So yeah. And this one will actually tell you that you can't do it. So like for example, there are no thrones. There's no way to get three ascension points. Game can't happen. Um, game is a 
Each level one throne gives you gives one point. Each level two gives two, so on and so forth. And the buffs and the uh, quirks associated. I won't even call them buffs. The quirks associated are more extreme at each level as well. Um, I say that because there are things where it's like, for example, the uh, Throne of Fire uh, gives two uh, fire gems, gives uh, blessed units a buff, and also increases heat. Which, as I've tanked both people's scales uh, towards heat, I think. No, I bumped Holmes towards cold, which is actually very useful against a girl because of the cold blood tree. Um, see, all these mechanics I'm realizing are, are factoring in that I didn't even plan to do that with. Um, and we haven't even started the game yet. But So for somebody who prefers a cold scale, though, like Kyla would absolutely not want to touch that throne with a 10-foot pole. However, in a setup like I have it set up right now, they would have to. They'd basically try to claim that throne last. Because claim throne effects affect your entire dominion when it says increases heat or does whatever. Uh, there are thrones of turmoil, which, yes, increases the turmoil scale in your entire dominion if you have it. But you need to claim the thrones to win, so what can you do? Um, here also, as they note, um, guarded by a slightly larger than usual independent force, and we give one and a minor bonus effect. It says minor, but bonus, but again, it's not necessarily a bonus per se. It is an effect. Um, but that's one advantage in this game mode that Agartha has over all. Um, before, four, like, powerful priests were neat and all, because level three priests can also cast a spell that blesses every single sacred unit on the battlefield as one spell, so you don't need a bunch of priests casting bless and hoping, um, if you have large groups of sacreds. But now they actually have a vital function on the map. Um, there's other things, uh, random events, you can actually set them up to rare. Um, numerous rare events for fast games you don't want to get randoms. Common events for slow games where you want much to happen in turn. Um, for example, play by email games. Um, because yes, this game is actually a play by mail game. Is one of the ways you can play this game. Isn't that wild? Um, now, things, story events. So, there are random events, uh, this at minor or all uh, story events. Some random events have chains, basically. Um, for example, you might discover a strange village that seems to be wracked with afflictions, and it turns out they're Cthulhu cultists. And there's events you can do off of that. Some are nation specific, like Tian Chi has some. Um, things like that. Uh, you can trigger those chains. Um, I like leaving it on because of maximum chaos. Score graphs. Um, there's three sets. Score graphs are disabled. Um, you'll be able to see the scores of allied nations unless your spies or spells gain knowledge more. Um, enabled, which just lets you see it all. Um, or just flat out info disabled. Um, I'll leave it enabled just so if I pull the game up which I might as well do. We're already two hours in, good lord. Um, not quite, but we're there. Um, just to show what it means, Hall of Fame is an extra effect, basically. Um, chosen at random, but basically 20 commanders on the map can be chosen, up to 20. Uh, not necessarily 20. And they will be noted for something. Um, and it gives them a bonus. Like, they can be noted for their heroic, uh, for their unequaled obesity is what I love. Um, it's a thing they can get, puts them in the Hall of Fame, it gives them extra encumbrance, 
but extra natural protection and hit points. Yeah. Um, so they literally have blubber shielding. Uh, but in addition to that, there are certain spells, death spell, I believe, that lets you revive a hero that's in the Hall of Fame. So, in addition to giving that person a quirk, typically a bu overall buff, not necessarily a complete buff, but typically buffs, it will always be a net positive, let's put it that way. Um, you can also then revive them. Um, of course, they can lose their spot on the Hall of Fame if somebody else does something. Uh, I don't know how it's calculated exactly, but they can lose their spot. It's not a guaranteed thing forever. Um, global enchantment slots, some of those rituals we went over. Can I just pull that up at any time? No. Okay. Um, only on the pretender screen. Good to know. But yeah, so some rituals uh, are long-lasting enchantments. Um, for example, Ulm has access to uh, an enchantment under the constructions that lets them call up the first forge in their capital which, or wherever they decide to cast the spell, but there's no reason not to cast it in your capital if you're casting it. Um, what it does is, so long as it's available, uh, it gives everyone an extra level of Master Smith. Um, there are other ones, like uh, high-level Death Mages can cast Utter Dark, which makes it a very bad time for everyone else. Um, they can be dispelled, but they require extra... Uh, it requires extra doing. Alternatively, it, killing the caster. Uh, so if you work out, if they cast a ritual and then for whatever reason take the mage that cast that when they go a fighting and you kill the mage, the enchantment ends, which is nice. But this basically is how many of those can be going in the world at a time. Um, and then things like uh, once you research construction level 8, you get access to forging unique artifacts. And when they say unique, they do actually mean unique in this game. So unique artifacts, um, for example, there's a set called the Armor and Sword of the Dawn. Uh, if you make a for if you forge the Sword of the Dawn, no one else can forge it. And there is the one copy that then sits in your treasury until you give it to one of your commanders. No one else can make it, and the only way they can get it then is by killing whatever commander you give it to and winning the battle overall. And then they have a chance of finding it. And then you cannot forge another one. You'd have to get it back by killing the person who now has it. Um, and so limiting the rate at which you can make them. Like, so at this point, you can only forge, like, say, the Sword of the Dark. If there's no limit... Right, limit. You can forge the sword, the armor, and the helmet, assuming you have enough mages of the high enough level. Um, whereas with this, you could only forge one item, regardless of how many mages of the level you have. Um, again, since this is two human factions, this would never be an issue. Um, human AI level, like you might want to dip out of the game, and if you dip out of the game, what level should the AI that replaces you be? You can hit disabled. So your faction just stops, basically. Uh, or you can replace yourself with anything on possible AI if you decide to put out the game. Um, it's two human players on the same computer. Not an issue. Disabled. Um, and then you have a scale for magic research. Uh, again, I usually am just testing stuff, so I leave it on very easy. But for the purposes of this and a closer to default setup though it won't be because I have mods one of which includes not having to search for lower level magic sites but we'll get into that and uh, yeah, I have a lot of just quality of life mods and also increased gem income um, from magic sites I keep doing this the th indicator isn't up here anymore but that's where it will be in the main menu and I will go back to the main menu before this ends, because we're already two hours in, and good lord. Um, master passwords, I don't bother with master password renaming. This is literally just renaming commanders, gods, prophets, whatever. So literally you can click on someone, 
click on a commander in your list. The commander list is up here in a province, by the way, is why I kind of gesture over here. Tap R on the keyboard, and then you can type in a new name for them. Um, cheat prevention. Just trying to cheat and prevent it as well as informing all players. Um, I honestly don't know how to cheat in this game. Like, I don't know if that's talking about third-party programs like Cheat Engine, or if there's actual cheats that you can type in in this game. But this will do for setting up the basics. So it will craft your map. And we hit the two hour mark. Cheers. Holy shit, my throat is sore. Um, I don't talk much normally. Uh, I can get animated in a conversation, but I don't talk to people much. And I don't talk much. So this is actually grating on my throat at this point. Good lord. Two hours straight of talking, especially when I haven't been recording in a while, is rough. Because, yeah, it's been some time. Uh, I think I did my last recording at the end of July. And this is now September. So, yeah, once the map is formed, I have no clue what the map is yet. I will in a second. You have the list of players. And then you have host. Host ticks over the next turn. And until you tick over the next turn, you can go to it. Um, at the start of a turn, you'll get a notice. It's early spring in the year zero. Oh, no, it's flat spring in the year zero. Um, in the beginning, there was chaos. And so this is all just flavor crap. Um, is what these ones are. Is it's telling you what's going on. So you hit exit, and boom. Now you can see the map. Um, since it's just two people, the girth is probably down here. Alternatively, over here somewhere because I am awfully close to that. Am I awfully happy right next to it? Now, on turn zero, you can't see what the garrison of nearby places are. So it's kind of a gamble if you want to start moving these defaults you start with. You start with a scout. A uh, Scouts can sneak, is why I went ahead and did that. So, uh, value is this value is an estimate of the number of patrollers required to have a 50% chance of discovering the stealthy unit. So, a uh, province that's patrolling with 60 people. Um, it's complicated, we'll get into that later, but I'll have a 50% chance of fighting my scout. So, in these places that don't have any of that stuff, there's no worries about sending a scout into neutral territory. Is the TL there? Um, again, province defense, you, your capital starts with 25. Um, I'm not actually looking at that. You can spend defense to increase it. And so, basically, doesn't cost any upkeep and will defend your province against small attacks. So basically, at even 25, if any faction attacks this place, in addition to, I, they have to be patrolling since I have a fort here. It's my capital. Crazy, I know. Um, so in addition to anyone who's patrolling, anyone who attacks this province will also have to deal with this group of units and commanders. Um, nothing fancy about the commanders, just a Black Acolyte, uh, Commander of Ulm. With, uh, I think that's 25 crossbows, some infantry of Ulm, and Picaniers. Um, uh, I'll just set him to research. There will never be uh, random magic sites in your capital, regardless of what uh, level of magic site chance there is. Um, so, basic recruitment. Um, I want one of those. I want two, but you don't start with that much money, so it may be prudent to just get some units as well. And so, yeah. As you can see, I have 312 res You can hover over, and then the bottom it tells you I have 325 gold left in the treasury. I get 312 resources a turn to spend, and that's with my uh, God's resource bonus. And then this product has 670 recruitment points. Um, required when recruiting units, not commanders. Commander point. Commanders require commander points. So each one, the recruitment points on commanders, is referring to these points. Since this castle is a citadel, it gives three commander points a turn. Um, holy points are required for recruiting sacred units. Um, Ulm's only sacreds are commanders, so that's not something Ulm has to worry about managing. Which is very nice. Um, whereas other factions like Maple Clan, which I didn't pick, but they 
their their holy points of their life. Um, so right now, since I don't have any research started, as Alm, I want to get up to a high level. Alm is also one of the few factions that has access to um, unique construction spells because their whole thing is iron, faith in iron. So I want to get high level construction as quickly as possible. Now my god, being a, gives 26 research points a turn, so it's going to take him two turns to get construction level 1. And then it's going to be like 100 to get to level 2, so on and so forth. So since I don't trust my odds of expanding just yet, that's going to do it for my turn with Paul. However, if I decide at any point, until I hit host, maybe I want to go back and change something. Maybe I'm not really sure. This is only an option for hot seat games, of course, if you have multiple human players. Um, if there's only one human player, you will never get this screen. This screen does not exist in one person games. Um, but then, like, for example, score graphs. There's nothing going on here because it's turn zero, but you can filter out and see how people are doing compared to you. Um, none of this shows up because it's still turn zero. This will be at one for both. That will change much. But, and then Hall of Fame. Nobody's in the Hall of Fame yet. Don't have to worry about it. But Pretenders of the World can give you this. And then based on your levels um, and nation, but based on your mage levels and nation, you get titles at the end. So Sandbone, the Mountain Lord, Protector of the Holy Mountain. That tells me he's an Earth Mage doesn't tell me anything else, but yeah, that tells me he's an Earth Mage, which, given a Garth as bonus, makes sense. Obviously, I know who he is. I made him. Um, yeah, wow, these have gone really generic this time around. Um, Prince of Inventions, Enemy of Darkness, then. I guess, I guess Prince of Inventions is Earth and Enemy of Darkness is Fire would make sense, but... Like, if I didn't know that, that wouldn't mean anything. What else is a Gartha? I already forgot what I did with a Gartha. Uh, right, mostly Earth and Fire. Um, and Death. But the traits are... Okay, so Gartha is all the way down here. Um, yeah. So you can click on Temples and it'll tell you about crap. Um, there. Again... Without being able to see, and then yeah, he can enter the Hall of Oracles to scry, but I'm not going to do that. That's why I have scouts. Um, recruitment here. I want to get a few Earth Readers, especially since my capital has my scales. Um, and if you right click, it'll tell you what each new scales does. And then just what strength you're going to use there. Um, Strengthening Dominion, so like, as you can see, despite the fact that this is Dominion 1, none of the scales are in effect. I don't think. Actually, I might just not be able to see that, but... It has a minor effect. Your scales are minorly affect other provinces that outside of your capital. Um, at low Dominion, at high Dominion, it basically mirrors your one you set up. Um, so I want some Earth Readers out of here. Um... I don't play Agartha, I don't know what's good. Um, I don't know if this is worthwhile or if I'm better off just going Agartha and Heavy Infantry. Um, I really don't. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, do I go ahead and go Ancient Ones? I mean, they are Sacreds, and if I keep spamming these, oh, these guys are Leadership 70, so they can no morale bonus for up to two squads. Um, I'm not going to go too far into this this time, but for example, army setup. The defaults gives you two unit types separated into two squads. Um, you can put them around. You can put them in formations um, sometimes. So basically, unless you have up to three squads, which is... I don't know if it's 60 or 80 to have this, but if you don't have at least the up to three squads, you 
don't have access to like line sparse and double line formations. You have access to skirmish and box, basically, if you don't have that. Um, this is what I might do here. Um, and then you can set general orders. You do not control your troops directly in battle, which is part of why I don't, like, why I'm tepid about moving out. Um, also, morale is very important. It's huge. I'm so huge in this game. Um, an elite unit and morale is high as 15. Uh, special monsters have morale 50, means they never leave, but they will dissolve if left with no commander. Um, and that's the thing. Uh, if your commander dies, your army takes massive morale penalties. Um, and basically it'll guarantee your army will rout pretty soon. So you don't want your commander to die. As such, things like that have stayed behind troops. And that's why, like, despite the fact that he is, uh, you know, he's got good armor. He's got decent protection. He might survive a few rounds of combat. I, I will never want to recruit these, honestly, or, like, use them in that capacity. What I want, like, hacky Earth leaders, um, okay, so they only have two squads, so they don't get to use lines, but, honestly, with 70 leadership and the ability to cast spells and do stuff from behind the lines, I would honestly just rather have them lead my armies. And especially if I end up going sacreds. Now, again, sacred units, gotta remember, holy point capped. So, like, I, if I try to get another one, nope, you can't actually recruit these because you don't have the holy points. Uh, not this turn, which is why they get phantomed out and why these guys are grayed out is because I'm out of commander points. Um, so, if you want to mass sacreds, um, because remember, sacreds are the only things you can bless. So all of that bless effect stuff, all of this, the decay weapons, the extra natural production, mountain survival. Well, okay, so the inspirational leadership thing, well, the leadership at least is just always there on sacred commanders. Okay, and the inspiration is there too. Um, so that's just there, but all of those other things, the withering weapons, the hard skin, those only happen when blessed. So if you don't have any priests in that army, like even an attendant of the Oracles is fine for this, um, for that purpose. Um, I would never, I wouldn't use it because why do that for literally not even double the cost? You can also make them an Earth Mage. Um, and that has more leadership as well. Um, and because it's a mage, can control magic, magic units. Um, would always go these, but having this, and having someone who can cast then bless, which will bless all these sacreds, that gives them withering weapons. If I just gave them to this guy, there is no way to take advantage of those bless effects. And so, all of that becomes worthless. Completely and utterly worthless. Hit host... It runs through everything. If there's battles, you'll actually see resolving battles, and it'll calculate the turns. Oh, world light events. The Veil of Infinite Horror has been found. So that spawns somewhere, and because of one of the mods I'm using that makes it so I don't have to search for sacred sites, uh, the effect of discovering it proc. It's been an event in Ulm, a handful of water gems. So now it's turn two. I have 10 earth gems because of two turns of that gem income. And now I've had a random event that gave me two water gems. Okay, my spy can see the throne of war. So for example, it spreads dominion. This one's a nice one actually, yeah, it spreads dominion. And then it gives you extra bless effects. So blessed troops get an extra plus one attack skill and an extra plus one morale plus one. Even if you never set up a bless, um, so, like, if you, for whatever reason, your god didn't have magic paths because you went, I don't know. I honestly can't think of a reason why you wouldn't have at least some. But, like, or say it's an incarnate-only buff, like a hard skin buff, but your god died. Well, now it's useless, but it still gives plus one morale to sacreds to bless them. 
not a significant buff without anything else going on, but still can be worthwhile. Um, and this is why I didn't try to expand right away. Like, I, wait, I have no way to get there because I have to go through these guys, but like, 40 barbarians. Yeah, the starting army for Ulm <sighs> might have made it. Might. Uh, but 40 barbarians can chew through a lot because they do a lot of damage. Um, and as you notice, I started with no ranged units whatsoever. Ranged units are good against them. I, I'll show you what combat looks like in this game. Um, but yeah, as you can see, you have all these different combat options, you know. And you can pick them for anything. Um, you can't, yeah. At most, five units are bodyguards. So, like, if you have a squad that's bigger than five people, you can't give them the guard commander tag. For whatever reason, units can't do any kind of fire at rearmost. Um... Commanders can, though. If you give a commander a ranged weapon, they can fire for your most. I don't know. Commander, this, whatever. Um, so there's three basic options. Fires is they're literally just not going to move. They're just going to just keep focus on shooting until they can't shoot anymore and then they attack. Hold and fire um, is they focus staying in place first before moving into firing range. Um, fire and keep distance is basically just... Uh, trying to keep this. It's like skirmish mode if you play Total War. Um, and then Retreat just tells them to immediately book it. Uh, none is just lull random. Um, though, within reason. Not like lull random, like you'll have crossbows charging if you need it or not. Just that uh, that it will pick what it thinks is best from this list. Um, so I'm going to have fire and keep distance, and then you can specify on any of the attack or fire commands, uh, none, like, no specific, it'll just target a random squad. You can tar have them target enemy archers, enemy cavalry, enemy flyers, large enemy monsters, or just whatever's closest. Um, attack options also have rearmost for troops, like I can, like I have them on holding attack closest, but I could have them try to, f like, for flanking units, you want to put them on rearmost. Um, the reason I have them on hold, actually, I'm going to go ahead and put them in line formation, um, and eke them back a bit, and you know what, I'm going to go ahead and put the commander a bit closer. You don't want to put him in here in case the enemy has ranged units, because then if they're targeting a squad and he's in it, eh, he's suddenly in the middle of being targeted, so you don't want that. Um, I will try to take these guys on just to show you what combat looks like in this game. That's it, by the way. That's This is all the control I have over the combat, is setting that stuff up beforehand and telling him to move. After that, I, I have no control over what happens. I'm just going to spam crossbows out of my capital, though. Um, crossbows are beautiful. You should always be commanding. You should always be recruiting um, both commanders and... if possible, at least out of your forts, um, and your capital is always a fort. So yeah, like as you can see, now I'm up to 37 because my, uh, yeah, so the thing is, my uh, god would be actually providing more research points if it weren't for the fact that we're in drain three. Only three more points, granted, so it would be 29 instead of 26, but still. But since these guys don't care, they give their full 11. They are old, which is a bit of a bummer, but whatever. It's fine. Um, so now we go to Agartha. They just know that the veil's been found. Uh, oh my god. A huge worm and mainly sea serpents. By Tiamat the Worm. The worm was one of those Dominion 2 god chassis. I don't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole. Which is... But there is an underwater throne, so eventually someone is going to, we are going to have to get in the water. Um, not that water, per se, but we could get into that. And Agartha actually has good reason to do so, and has the troops to do so. Um, still spamming out Earth Readers, which is good. Um, 
I will go ahead and go for more with an infantry on on to these for now because I want to put them with him for uh, one research and to clarify. Um, the reason that you have them in two squads is morale checks are made as a squad. So for example, say these run in, half of them get wiped, they have to take a morale check because uh, all units that knock up circle automatically are all commanders are dead or have left the battlefield. Um, the uh, no thing happens with morale check. Moralizing events are getting wounded if someone in the same squad dies and certain match effects. So basically, if they the more percentage of health the squad loses, the worse penalties it takes to morale checks. If a morale check is failed, the entire squad routes. So like if some of them get killed and then like I still have 10 left but the morale check fails all 10 of them will just try to leave the field immediately um so it's good to break them up but not break them up too much because if you break them up too much just getting hit could cause routes um and it's generally not how you want that to go now in multiplayer actually I can probably take that that's probably not a concern the light cavalries are a concern because light cavalries are horse archers, as you can kind of see from the sprites. And yes, despite the sprites have not changed in over a decade, but this game was released in 2017. Um, so make of that what you will. Now, this is a very bizarre map that I wrote in, a very bizarre place in the map that Agarth is in. But all right, so everywhere I have gone except maybe, uh, yeah, so as you can see, there were the two battles that they counted out. Um, Jira, we won, but we did take casualties. We lost five men. Go ahead and click view battles to see what happened. So we have my troops over here. There's over there. Crossbows hit. Now, barbarians are scary. They do a lot of damage, and as is the case with this guy, they go berserk. Once they take damage. So he took it, and he is profuse bleeding, so he's losing health over time. But things like, for example, strength. It's base 13, but since he berserked, it's up to 16. Which causes his damage to be go through the roof. He does almost 30 damage in a hit, basically. If it gets through, like, if it if he hits, uh, yeah, like, my crossbows will still die. Um my infantry will barely survive, I think. Yeah, and honestly, it's not that much of a jump from what barbarians normally do. Two-handed weapon people are scary. That said, my people do the same thing, so... So yeah, they're, they're trying to keep distance, so they're running away as they should. They're picking off people. And since he's stay behind troops, his goal is literally to be behind the furthest back troops. So most yep, and their army routed. Um so as you can see they're booking it for the hills, which is how these guys are fine. He since he's berserk, he doesn't give a crap. His morale is ninety nine. He does not actually route. Which is why it's actually kinda of surprising that he doesn't kill him. Oh. Got him. Cool. But yeah, and so the rest of them are running off the field. My guys are giving chase. Um, and this is why Arbalists are nuts. They're the longest ranged ranged weapon in the game. Um, outside of spells and a few other things. But So this is what a no magic battle looks like. As you can see, I can't do anything. I can adjust how fast this moves. I can actually... Toggle to see what squares are controlled by who. Or you can show the grid of squares. Um, and squares work exactly like they would in D&D or something like that, where squares are yours, squares are theirs, squares are whatever. Um, independents just automatically die after they route. Um, is why it says 35 died, even though the kill 
results don't add up. Crossbow and killed three three people. All commander got that one routing bar that one berserking barbarian chief. And then the infantry killed. Fourteen, so yeah, that's seventeen that we killed. We killed about half. But they all died because they're regs and and their independence and no one cares. So now here, since this was a barbarian province, I have access to barbarians here. You'll note I don't have access to any of the units I have in my capital here. There are ways to get some of them. I say some of them because you have to remember these ones are capital only. So no matter what, I will only ever be able to recruit things like the priest smiths in my capital. That's a bit of a downer. And the black priests. Those two are the big downer uh, for Middle Age all. However, things like my Master Smiths could theoretically recruit elsewhere. In order to do so, I need to first, in the case of Master Smiths, I need to send one of my Priest Smiths out, uh, which I will go ahead and send Arnold. I would need to construct building, build palisades. Forts have multiple levels. Palisades are just the lowest level. Um, afterwards, it, like, it takes four months to build that. Um, that's how you admin 15 recruitment points. Uh, so what forts do, in addition to letting you recruit your national troops in a new place, um, no, fortune war, huge war, let's head, send you home. some of my actual infantry um, and with a crossbow. The whole point of this early setup is basically just the uh, the whole point of my melee line is to hold the line while my archers do the DPS um, which is a very effective no mage setup. Uh, once you get to the late game with high levels of research and things, uh, you also want to get high evocation as you want construction and evocation as Ulm, so you can get to your Iron Darts, Iron Blizzard. Iron Blizzard is a terrifying spell um, to have thrown at you. So you want to get high evocation, because it makes your mages so useful in combat. That is the equivalent of... Since remember, my Arbalists can only fire every three rounds, and I believe the casting time on Iron Blizzard is just 100%. Yeah, 100%. So that means it casts once per round. At 30 effects, that's the equivalent of shooting. That's what... And that's just the level 1s. So that's not even somebody who's got 2 Earth Magic. Um, 2 Earth Magic throws 35. So that's the equivalent of freaking... 35 times 3 crossbows firing. Um, which is insane. Um, and it's magic, and it's armor you're using. And magic is important because um, things like ethereal have reduced chances for being hit from non-magical, and then this does an extra two times damage against magic beings, so odds are if it's ethereal, it's going to hurt more. Um, but yeah, it throws dishes a lot of damage at high evocation. So it's something you want to get as all. So, pull an inspective. Right now at construction zero, because that's where I'm at, I can forge trinkets. And forge, basically, all of these have level one requirements. I actually can't forge a bunch of these, because fire magic, level one. Normally, it would cost five. I have a mod that makes it cost less. Um, and then some items, like black steel, is reduced for all primarily because uh, a lot of the infantry of Ulm it says full plate of Ulm but it's it's black steel plate basically that's why if you hover it says magic that's because this is black steel it has the stat line of black steel it functionally is black steel they're just not calling it black steel there um 
but not the weapons. Not the weapons. So that thing is like if I gave him a like if I go back to forge, if I give him, I actually can't even make the one I'm thinking of right now. But yeah, like if I made him this black steel plate, his armor would actually go down. Now, if I gave him this black steel sword, it might actually improve his situation, but only by making it magic, um, and not by much. So that's why that stuff is reduced to like nothing for all, because that doesn't actually help anyone. The only people it really helps is, like, the smiths and the mages. And you don't want to give them too much armor. Because armor is encumbrance. And encumbrance, especially encumbrance from armor, is enhanced for spellcasting purposes. Sort of like uh, old-style D&D, how mages took penalties for casting when wearing armor. Um, same idea, because otherwise they'd just be broken. Um, so that's that, um, this one might have, yeah, this one had a priest, so there's some spell casting going on in this one. Um, we won, though. We lost eight light infantry, which honestly is better than I thought it would go. So we'll go ahead and watch this. Um, so one of the things you'll notice is, yeah, so... Jaguar Tribe is basically mixed clan as an independent. Um, I could clarify what I mean by that, but basically their faction units of Miklon are very, very, very similar to Jaguar Tribe. Um, and so this is actually similar to their base priests. So this is a level 1 priest and a level 1 nature mage. Though it is an inept researcher, so it only gives 3 points of research. So if it was an alms domain, it would provide 0 research. But... So we'll see, and then it'll do its thing. All of theirs have slings, so there's really no reason not to just charge. Um, but yeah, so cast, cast Vine Arrow. It didn't hit anything, because that's a single effect spell you have to actually hit with to do anything. But yeah, like you'll notice he's already got 46 fatigue, because he's got his the fatigue cost of casting spells. If it hits a hundred, he passes out and stops doing the spell. So he casts Tangled Vines on these guys. So they're basically stuck there until they make a strength check to get out of it. Uh, Vine Arrow is basically the same thing, except it also does some damage and a single target. But yeah, you'll notice these guys are essentially naked. Base protection zero, so if any of my units hit, they are just taking chunks out of these people. That guy hit for 15. That is more health than humans have. Humans typically have 10. So, it is just casually, yeah, 25. He's dead. He is so dead. Which is reflected by the fact that, like, the Jaguar Warriors have some protection from their armor. But not a lot. Meanwhile, he is, yeah, so he's hit Fatigue 21, which means after that Tangle Vines, the spells stop for a bit. What's up with you? You are crippled. Okay. So, God, yeah, you have a combat spirit, so that explains why you're so late to the party. Which isn't a bad thing, per se. So, yeah, the, they hit like a truck in melee, but... Especially since my light infantry don't have much in terms of protection. But. Building this against my heavy infantry, they aren't really doing much. Like, he got some hits in, but he's still fine. Um, and then they routed. Um, so, once again, they just try to book it to the edge of the map. Everyone who gets out dies anyway because they're independents. If they were another player. Omens, luck plus one there. I'll take it. Unrest and misfortune. I will not take. Well, I have to take that. But... Wow. Flesh garden of mortal remains produces death in nature. Flesh garden to astral. So yeah, when you take a place, normally you have to send someone to find these, and like this could only be found by a death mage. I don't know of what level exactly, but and both of these need an astral mage. Um, well, the scrying pool might only be water, but. 
probably astral, actually, because it gets more astral than water. Um, so normally you need to send a mage of the relevant path. So, like, if I sent one of these Earth Readers, I wouldn't find any of that. But, yeah, and so this is just a scout. This isn't a spy like what Ulm has. So he's not discovering as much information when he's checking these places out. Um, I am going to send you home. And so again, all I have access to here, and I can't even recruit a commander here, um, because the Jaguar Tribe Priest, since it is sacred and a mage, all mages need a lab in the province, and all sacreds need a temple. So that means it's, I can send him um, all, and if you are, if you're not sacred, you can't build temples, and if you're not a mage, you can't build labs. So that means is this guy cannot set up the means to recruit one of those uh, uh, Jaguar tribe priests, which is not inherently a bad thing to have. So yeah, and also in addition to his one nature, one priest level that he's guaranteed, he has a 10% chance to have one of these four paths. Um, so that's a great way to break so like finding independent mages like this is a great way to break into gem setups you wouldn't normally have like, at that point I set up because I don't have nature yeah Agartha doesn't have nature as an option um, yeah because Agartha has no randoms so normally if it weren't for this, I would have absolutely no way of casting any of these nature spells. I've just pulled this up as an example, but I would not be able to get any of these. This is going to be a three-hour intro and first thing. Um, good lord. And this isn't even like an actual play. So I guess I'll do this as just like a tutorial of playing a game. Um, this is the first episode. I'll try... I won't... I shouldn't need to explain as much per, but this was just explaining setup and the first two turns is what's passed. Um, and so, yeah. This is a very convoluted game. There's a lot going into it. And hopefully I'll be able to keep doing this. So, since we're already two and a half hours in, let's just go for an even three, shall we? We're already here. Um, I might stream this, honestly. But then there's the issue of streaming times. Whereas with this, I don't know. Let me know in the comments. One or two people that actually watch this in my comment. Actually, my one person probably won't because it's three hours. And I don't blame him for saying fuck that noise. Oh, yeah, and that's another thing. Um, So, as a Gartha, I forgot to set up research. And the research queue is empty. That does not mean that it hasn't been doing anything. It has, if you'll notice. Oh, I didn't notice that your starting research is also based on your drain scale. So since these guys didn't have drain, they have level one thaumaturgy already, and I assume they had that much conjuration to begin with. But if you don't have anything in your research queue, it goes for the first one, first school that isn't completely researched. So in this case, it's all of it's been going into conjuration, which isn't bad per se. I mean, at level 3 Conjuration, I have a bunch of National Summons. I might want to go ahead and take it down to like 3 or 4. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and go 4 for now. Um, I have a lot of enchantments. Attentive statues, summon statues at uh, 1 for 2 Earth Gems, and Light and Sentinels. Yeah, I want to get that up to at least five. And everyone needs construction. I don't care what they tell you, because there are very important magic items. And so, yeah, since you only see what spells you have the pass for, so since both of them have fire and earth, both of them can forge the black steel swords, fire swords, burning blades, the works. Since this guy has water, air, okay, so he has everything. He can see every item. Um, at at the trinket level, everything only requires level. One. Oh no, 
one thing doesn't. So yeah, like you can see every, this is all the trinkets that can be forged, basically. That's another advantage of rainbows if you're just trying to test stuff. But the trade-off is, again, since a lot of these I'm just level one in, like I'm level one in everything except earth, fire, and death. Um, a lot of things at trinket level only require level one. Um, and the requisite gems, though, I ha again, mods I have drop that down. Normally this would cost five water gems, but whatever. But yeah, so like you can see, like for example, this needs Astral Magic 2, Death Level 2, and then three gems of each. I have the gems. The gems I have, but since this guy only has level one Astral, he's good on death, but since he only has level one Astral, he can't forge this. You can still see it, though, because you have the paths, just not the right levels. There's a reason for that. Um, later on, I didn't know this was a thing. That's why I looked at it. Um, later on, um, I think it's I think it's level four construction you need. The is the example I'm thinking of. Um, there are items that artificially give you extra levels. Alternatively, there's also this not that not alchemy. Don't do alchemy. Ever. Um, you will hate yourself. It's empowerment. Um, it's expensive. It is very expensive. Uh, getting level 1 costs 50, then from 1 to 2 is 30, 2 to 3 is 45, and then 3 to 4 is back up to 50, I think. And then beyond that, it's more, but this is expensive. I have mods to up gem income, and I'm automatically finding research sites, and this would still take me, you know, if I find an air site, 30 turns. It's not a sustainable practice. So what do you do? Well, at level four construction, for example, um, so researching four levels of construction, which is why everyone needs construction, because it's the forging, um, there's an item called the Skull Staff. For 10 death gems, anyone who's holding the staff that has death magic gets an extra level for literally all intents and purposes. So I make a skull staff with him. That it only you only need to be level two death to make a skull staff. I have him equip a skull staff. He's now a level five death mage for as long as he's holding that skull staff. That's why construction is super important. Um, now this not yep that's another thing about things that have the crippled setup is that they can die if you send if you move them too much um or at all i'm not entirely sure what the requirements are for it um so why did i move you uh yeah normally you'd have to search for magic sites i can have him do it he's not gonna find anything um like i said the mod and because my scout as a spy, I see all already discovered. Uh, oh god. Okay, so avoid this. Y you don't want nothing to do with this. It does give death gems, but increases death in the province. So most magic sites, when they have things like increases death, they mean in that province. Not throughout your domain. But this... You don't want this. It's the number one cause of non combat and possibly the number one if you're stupid and let your people starve. Um, pro tip, don't let your army starve. Alright, I'm gonna go ahead and send these guys. They should be able to clear it out. Um, a couple more of them. Or you. Um, that's it. I could recruit our barbarians, but there's no real need. Um, oh yeah, and just to show, he doesn't need to do it, but since he is a priest and a mage, he can build temples and labs. So, I'm sure she's not going to find anything. Um, the reason you'll notice, uh, priests can also preach. Um, preaching can raise the dominion if you just have them preach in the middle of nowhere up to their priest level, so since he's priest level 1, it only gives level 1 dominion. If you build a temple, they can preach one higher, so he could preach it up to dominion 2. Um, 
things like that. But like you'll notice, even in some of these, like it's got four of my dominion, but it's only got order one, heat one. It doesn't even have cold. Granted, it is summer. So yeah, like as you can see, the colding is not affecting nearly as much as I had said it to because of summer. Um, so for this part of the year, it's not even an issue. Um, and that's probably why so many areas are heat two right now is because it's the middle of summer. Um, but yes, who's gonna? Oh yeah, we're starting to get a new famous hero. Um, heroic toughness. So. Now he's got heroic toughness, receives an increased number of hit points. So hit, his hit points is 21. To put that into perspective, the average, which one is he? He's the uh, hammer and open face, got it, um, has 14. So he got an extra seven hit points for that, which is nice, it's free. It also, go to the Hall of Fame, you see everyone who has it, how many kills they have, their experience. Bernard the Brave is a mercenary. Um, might as well cover that now. Mercenaries show up. They tell you right now, like, the person commands X amount of men and demands X amount. But you can only ever see the commander. Um, and pretty small at that. So he appears to be a dude with a longsword and crossbow, so he's not a mage. Um... I don't know what unit type he carries with him. Could be worth it, might not be. Um, but mercenaries are mercenaries. They function exactly the way the way you'd expect. Um, give me X amount of gold, and they work for three turns. So if you and everyone can bid in real time. So for example, here, if I he's demanding 162, I can hit higher. I can bid up to my treasure, basically. Hit OK, reset, because I don't actually want to do that. And that's my bid. Now, this same turn, the Agartha player might also want him. The reason you might want him is some mercenaries are special. Like, some mercenaries have uh, are amphibious. Like, there's the shipwreckers, which are Atlanteans, which means they can go into the water. Which, for someone like Alm, who can't normally go into the water, is pretty useful. Um, it, for at least securing a foothold in the water. Um, that's an island. Farmland island. But yeah. Um, so, that can be a reason uh, to pull them out from your enemies. Because at the end of those three turns, they basically put their contract back up for bid. And if you do it at the right time, it can screw with people if they were using them to expand. Um, or just to have some extra bodies to throw at your enemies for a while. Um, also an option. Mercenaries will fill that slot if you have extra gold. Okay, and yeah, so as you can see, they hit Conjuration level 2. Um, do want construction, but I don't think that was enough. Um... I forgot to send you back to pick up troops. That was dumb of me. Okay. So now him, we're just going to have him flat out build a temple in a lab there. Because the goal is to get a couple shamans. Um, just to have. Um, again, in another, in another life, I wouldn't have... Ooh, that's got a castle in it. For some reason. Probably the result of a magic site, but occasionally castles will pop up as, uh, yeah. Um, 30 main these shamblers for a throne guard. Eh, uh, there's probably mages protecting them. Um, now one of the other things you can do, cast ritual spells. And this will just pull up, since I only have two levels, everything I can do. Um, Agartha's normally in caves, but I, this isn't a cave, so I can't summon kobolds. Um... Uh, so, like, all the ones I can cast are highlighted in theory. I think. Yeah, because that's level 2, which I don't have, and then some of these can only be cast in caves. Water weirds, I'm pretty sure. I don't know, I guess not only underwater, but electric eels are. Um, Night gaunt can only be cast in caves. 
which this isn't Killer Mantis, I'm just gonna hide it. Um, so yeah, I can cast any of these uh, Black Servants. Uh, it's just a free Death Scout if you don't have Scouts. I don't know what kind of world you live in that you don't have Scouts, but if you really need Scouts, that's a way to do it. Um, but yeah, rituals are anything from summoning minions, which is what all those are. You don't get summonable companion, compa ugh, commanders until higher levels. Um, I am going to go ahead and mass sacreds in the capital. And I might send an Earth Reader with the next party. Um, I might double it up. So yeah, he's building a temple there. Which, if there were any sacreds here, like, um, there are Jaguar Warriors that Mictlan can get anywhere, basically, that are sacred. Um, Marignan has flagellants. I use Mictlan because Mictlan's got a lot of the weird mechanics. Um, they're also a heavily blood nation. And one of the few that gets blood slaves, naturally. Um, cover that when we actually worry about blood. This one is not worrying about blood. Blood is weird. That's all you need to know for now. Blood is a weird mechanic. Mictlan has a lot of it. Mictlan has crap units, but good sacreds if you give them a good blast. Um, so I keep pulling them up because they've got the weird ones. Um, Marignan is another one where uh, they have flagellants, which are weak. They're glass cannon units, even with a proper buff. Um, but they can, they're recruit anywhere sacreds. Like, you don't need a fort, you just need a temple, and you pop them out of anywhere. Um, so yeah, right now we're gonna just pick everybody up. Um, this is very slow, is what I've gathered from all the descriptions of play that I've seen. I'm also going to go ahead and, uh, since I only have the one breeder and there's some unrest, I'm going to go ahead and bump the defense up to 40. 40 is enough to take care of just about every single negative event. So even if his uh, fortune teller 5 doesn't need to save it, uh, 40 defense will. And also, at every 10, it reduces unrest and gives you patrol strength. So, 20, so 26 patrol strength. Less than 50% chance to find enemy scouts, but that's what it is. Um, but more importantly, uh, unrest will reduce tax income, so if gold is an issue, which it kind of is for me, because unlike Ulm, I'm a lot more gold intensive than resource intensive on those, at least. Better to the halls, it's kind of, yeah, but my sacreds. And I'm getting sacreds. Um, so that's that. How'd that battle go? I lost and my commander died. Okay, I lost because my commander died. Which is a shame because it, it, this looks like a mer this looks like a mutually assured destruction situation. I. Did I read that wrong, or did they just get their troops back? Okay, yeah, so those Wolf Tribe archers are all that's left there. I guess they sniped him. Let's find out. That's my guess, is those archers sniped my commander. Crossbow fire did not hit the uh, Wolf Tribe. Regiment, who is a nature mage and was able to cast personal regeneration, so he can actually heal... 10%, which for him factors into one a turn, basically. Yeah, the those wolf driver fired the arm lists. lists are firing out of them, so. Okay, that took out the shaman. Oh no, it's the cheeky barbarian lord around. Okay. Yep, he's gonna catch up, fight my commander, and kill the survive it, but he will live it. Yup, because there's the rage and yep, he's dead. Oh wait, only one of them died, so no, he might actually survive this. And my arm is routed because the commander's dead. Of course, everybody else 
also routed to it looks like, so everyone who's routed is dead. It's incredibly vexing because the archers aren't routed technically because that raging commander won't leave the field. So yeah, they that commander broke through, killed my commander, and forced a chain route. Um, didn't lose much though. So yeah, he didn't find any magic sites because there weren't any to find. That's not surprising. Um, he can't lead the units though. At least not well. So. Could get a barbarian lord myself, but might as well just get a better cover with the extra points I have. Um, no real reason not to, after all. Well, do it next turn. Just key him in like that. So what I got out of that though is that my uh, my front line was not big enough. Because that guy was able to sneak around, basically. Um, it's very unfortunate. It's in, uh, as far as I can tell. Another one? Spreads deadly diseases. There's a lot of deadly disease magic sites here. I swear to God. Um, and the one place I expanded to gives gold, not. So one of the other things, as and as a general, why don't you just build forts everywhere? Because it gives you access to your national units and more income and everything else, and resources and supplies. The answer is because it draws from everywhere else. So like, if I take this, this area is going to lose some of its production, um, some of its resources, some of its income, and it's going to go to the fort. Forts are good at centralizing resources and everything else, so it will give you that. And a bonus. Um, don't forget exactly how it works. High administration, gather more resources from neighboring provinces, and tax the province more efficiently. All to provide extra supplies, though decreases the troops that they send. Um, so yeah, it will get extra... There, I think it's a net positive. Um, but yeah, so it'll gather from these surrounding provinces that I control. So once I control this, the resources here will go up. Um, granted, it's already going up because I'm spamming priests that give uh, mage priests, which give resource bonuses. Um, which is what is allowing me to recruit more crossbowmen. Which is... My bread and butter is all... Um, yeah, Cripple died, which isn't surprising. Yeah. Unrest... So there are a few ways to deal with unrest. So that was a plus 12, but every turn it's going to lose four uh, unrest because of the defense 40. He did not prevent that. I grieved. Or I would be if I didn't see it coming, I guess. Um. So we're going to stick these with Recorred here. And we're going to move them up here. They're going to be a hold and attack rear. Not because for any particular reason. So first thing we're gonna do. With the yes, with mages, you can tell them to cast up to five specific spells and then just give them a general um, So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna throw blessing down a couple times. Just to make sure we get all our secrets. Then just I don't care. Just go ahead and spam flying shards. It's a garbage spell, but I don't have any evocations or anything you can cast from the search, so might as well. It's better than nothing. And it keeps him out of the front lines. So we're gonna take these guys and we're gonna make an effort of it. Um, the goal is for my melee line to hold the line while my sacreds smash into their commanders and kill them. Um, my sacreds could very well be a hold the line group as well, but there's no real need. Um, 
all I have are melee infantry. And so it's not really important that they do that. Um, so a route is as good a use of their talents as anything. But yeah, that is uh, this game. Uh, turn late summer, so spring, late spring, early summer, summer, late summer. So this is turn five. Five turns. Uh, I will probably just keep going, but uh, I will end the episode here because we're at the three hour mark. Uh, if you stuck with this, thank you very much. I know there was a lot of just technical crap and the graphics of this game look like they're from a million years ago, but it's a it's so they can process the number of things. And I'm not even showcasing some of the really crazy spams you can do yet. <laughs> yet is the keyword there. But yeah, uh hope you enjoyed it and I will see you guys next episode. Bye bye.